and the dot or bacon house. It's a great pleasure to welcome you today. Um, let me begin by uh, thanking the Common Family Foundation for the support for all of the human rights up front, the process, and for the conference as well. Let me also remind you that HRNK is uh, America's perhaps only fully bipartisan think tank and civil society organization dedicated exclusively to investigating, researching, and reporting on the North Korean human rights situation. Um, Dr. Orbegan, of course, is a jewel of PC architecture, house of uh, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall, founding um, father of the U.S. Supreme Court. Secretary of State is a symbol of both the U.S. justice system and uh, the diplomacy, the perfect place to call this conference. Um, our goal today is to celebrate COI plus 10, 10 years since the, the resolution, the UN Human Rights Council resolution that established the uh, UN Commission of Inquiry. Uh, we are also here to address the security human rights nexus and to find ways to elevate the importance of human rights next to the critical political security and military issues. As your MC today, my mission is very easy. None of the distinguished speakers uh, need an introduction. They're very well known, very prominent uh, luminaries in both security and human rights issues. Uh, we are extraordinarily pleased and honored to host the His Excellency Ambassador Cho Taehong, Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the United States of America, as our introductory keynote speaker today. Ambassador Cho has been a career diplomat for, many, for several decades. Uh, during his foreign service, his primary focus has been North Korea's nuclear affairs. In the South Korea-US alliance, he has served as Director General for North Korea Nuclear Affairs, later as Director General for North, Korean, uh, for North American Affairs. Uh, he has been Special Advisor to several foreign ministers. He's been a senior official in the office of the president. He has served as ambassador to the Republic of Ireland and to the Commonwealth of Australia. He's also served as special representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs, first vice minister of foreign affairs. Uh, in May 2020, he became a member of the 21st National Assembly. He was chair of the International Committee and vice chair of the Policy Committee of the PPP. People's Power Party. Most importantly, as a member of the National Assembly, Ambassador Cho Teon continued to be um, a promoter of freedom and human rights. In particular, freedom and human rights for the people of North Korea. And that is something that those of us, representatives of civil society, always remember. Everybody will remember Ambassador Cho. It's an extraordinary honor to host the him. Thank you, sir. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, thank you, Brad, for a very kind introduction. As you saw, that, uh, my bio says I've been involved in the efforts to try to address this of North Korean nuclear issue for over two decades. And as you see, what is happening to North Korean nuclear programs and missile programs, I cannot say the efforts were successful. But I also want to say that the um, capability and coordination between the United States and ROK to cope with nuclear and missile threat from North Korea actually has increased uh, in a dramatic way almost. And now the ROK and US are talking about the way to um, the upgrade the effectiveness of extended deterrence. And last week, um, we had a uh, deterrent strategic committee uh, tabletop exercises, eighth in all. But what is more important and what really makes this a different one is that um, the uh, two governments, the planners, are putting their heads together for a, a, about the scenario where North Korea uses, actually uses nuclear weapons and come up with some kind of uh, responses and also before responses 
that the way to the uh, deter North Korea from using nuclear weapons. And then these two delegations all went down to the uh, Kings Bay Naval Base, a submarine base in the state of uh, Georgia for the first time. So what I'm saying is that um, North Korean nuclear threat has grown, has become a clear and present danger for both countries. But in response to that, the capability and the willingness to coordinate uh, between US and Arab Pay also has grown, and that's good news for the safety and the peace of mind of the people of my country as well as the United States. So that's for the nuclear issue. Now I'd like to turn to the main subject of today's gathering, that is North Korea's human rights. Well, Ambassador Robert Joseph. Ambassador Lee Shima, who is joining uh, virtually from Seoul. Ambassador Robert King, my good friend, good to see you again. And HRNK co chair, Emeritus Robert Cohen, very nice to meet you. And uh, distinguished guests, dignitaries, and the, those who are committed to the improve, improvement of human rights of North Korea. Um, it is a great, it is my great honor to be among you this morning to talk about this subject. Well, in 2013, the, when the Honorable Michael Kirby was named as the chair of the uh, committee, Commission of Inquiry, I was actually in Canberra serving as Korean ambassador to Australia. I, um, I was well aware of Michael Kirby's reputation and his determination. So I knew that something good and something very important would come out of this international undertaking called a COI. Well, the, over the past decade, the COI has been at the forefront and center of the international community's efforts to address concerns regarding human rights situation in North Korea. The Commission's report addresses all of these issues in a, a most comprehensive and the, uh, uh, factual way. And his recommendations have lost an ounce of relevance to this day. Needless to say, reporting on human rights conditions in North Korea is an extremely difficult undertaking. Few outsiders are allowed into the Hermit Kingdom, and we have very, very limited knowledge of the situation on the ground. And yet, despite all of the odds stacked against it, the COI delivered. It has documented gross human rights abuses in North Korea and its persistent crimes against humanity. For, for both of which the Pyongyang regime bears sole and complete responsibility. The exemplary work performed by the Commission not only put the DKRK human rights issues under the global limelight and microscope, I think, but also highlights the urgent need for the world to unite and mount a serious response. I'd like to convey my sincere gratitude to the commissioners and staff members of the UNCOI for their decades-long contribution to this noble cause. My special thanks also go to Executive Director Greg Scalati and his associates in HLNK, not only for organizing today's very important event, but also for their commitment and dedication. I happened to meet uh, Greg uh, a couple of years ago while I was still in the National Assembly. I organized, as a member of the National Assembly, I organized a, um, um, a seminar, a hybrid seminar, both you know, the, uh, a virtual and in person. And Greg actually was participating from Washington, D.C., and delivered a um, very judicious assessment of the efforts or lack of efforts that Korean government has been doing at that time for the, for the sake of North Korean human rights. 
And it's my present duty to report to you this morning with the change of government in Seoul, the new government in Korea takes North Korean human rights very, very seriously. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are well aware, my government is gravely concerned about human rights conditions in North Korea. And along with our like-minded partners, we have been voicing this concern around the world. And that's the Ishin Hwa is leading my government's efforts to bring together all these international efforts. In addition, Korea has co-sponsored the latest iteration of the annual UNGA resolution concerning human rights conditions in North Korea. In his inaugural address, President Yoon Suk Yeol placed the universal value of freedom at the center of his message, the first for Korean president. He emphasized the need for global solidarity in helping those deprived of their rightful dignity as free citizens. North Korean residents living under totalitarian oppression should be among the principal beneficiaries of our concerted efforts. Universal values of freedom and basic human rights extend to all human beings, including our brothers and sisters, north of the DMZ. Hence, my government will redouble its efforts to improve human rights conditions in DPRK, making it a priority objective to be pursued across the whole of government. At the same time, we will be certainly open to the idea of humanitarian assistance to meet the urgent needs of North Korean people if there is a need for that. Distinguished participants, in addition to its own merits, advocating human rights in North Korea will also help advance our goal of denuclearization and deter future aggression from China. If North Korean residents were granted even a fraction of the basic rights and freedom that we enjoy, the urgent need to save its starving masses would steer the regime away from its nuclear missile programs. However, we know that this is not something that can be achieved by a single government. To hold the Pyongyang regime accountable for its horrible actions and to bring about substantive changes to the current human rights conditions there, it is imperative that the international community come together as one. That is where our deep rooted partnership with the United States is one of our greatest assets. As we welcome the 75th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Commission of Inquiries activities, Korea and the United States will enhance our coordination to address human rights issues in North Korea. In this regard, we welcome President Biden's nomination of Ms. Julie Turner as Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues. I look forward to being able to work together with Ambassador Turner once she is confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Meanwhile, the Korean government will also strengthen our engagement with our, with our many NGOs specializing in human rights issues which can constitute yet another important pillar of Korean government's efforts in this domain. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was a member of the Korean National Assembly, I took it upon myself to restore legislation dedicated to North Korean human rights issues and North Korean Human Rights Act, and to maintain up-to-date records of Pyongyang's violations. In particular, these records of violations are a vital ingredient of any effort to hold the aggressor, hold the violator accountable, and to ensure an environment where our past wrongdoings can never be repeated. Therefore, I strongly believe that there should be an effort to maintain and update those records in addition to the ongoing activities of the UN COI. The new Korean government began 
the efforts in earnest to restore the implementation of this very important North Korea Human Rights Act. And first step forward was to appoint a uh, North Korean Human Rights Envoy of Korea, a position which was vacant, unfortunately, for the last five years. And as you know, Professor Lee is a very, very energetic person. He, she travels around, she meets a lot of people, she really is um, uh, the lifting these issues into the priority issues that many countries, US and Korea included, will have to pay attention to. So, distinguished guests, in conclusion, today's event is an important opportunity for the bright minds gathered here to evaluate the UNCOI's progress over the last 10 years and discuss where it should, it should head into in the future. There are many, many important questions, and our answers to these questions will have far-reaching implications for the lives of the 26 million men and women and children uh, who live in North Korea. With these high stakes in mind, I hope today serves as a launch pad, the uh, beginning of our long and renewed efforts for the many great ideas which will guide us through the next decade. Now, quest to bring a real change to make a real difference in the, in the human rights conditions in North Korea. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Cho. The only Ambassador Cho has mentioned uh, the new government of uh, President Kim Song yeol is fully dedicated to addressing, to tackling the North Korean human rights situation. And uh, perhaps one of the first signs that that was the case was uh, the appointment of our next speaker, Ambassador Ishi Ma, was appointed ambassador at large on international cooperation on North Korean human rights issues uh, by MOFA, by the Minister of Foreign Affairs in uh, 2022. As Ambassador Cho has mentioned, Ambassador Lee uh, is extraordinarily busy. She also lives a secret life as a university professor and she has to do both. So it's <laughs> two full time jobs right there, plus a lot of world travel. Uh, Ambassador Lee is a professor of political science and international relations at Korea University. Uh, she has held uh, multiple professional positions with the World Bank. Uh, she's a former member of the UN Secretary General's Peace Building Fund. She was a special advisor to former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan on the Rwandan Independent Inquiry. Um, and uh, she has also headed the research committee of the Seoul Forum for International Affairs. Uh, she's been a visiting professor at the School of International Public Affairs uh, and the Department of Political Science at Columbia University, a visiting scholar at Princeton University. And um, of course, um, she uh, she hails from the University of Maryland. She uh, got her PhD at the University of Maryland. It's so the postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University. Uh, most importantly, uh, Master Lee has already cooperated very closely with HRNK. We were in New York City at a side event together uh, in the fall of last year on the sidelines of the third committee of the General Assembly. Uh, we've done a couple of other events. We'll meet again on the 17th of March in Geneva, UN side event, Raymond. Are we ready? Excellent. Uh, Ambassador Yishin Ma. The virtual floor is all yours. Well, Secretary General Greg Scaratu, thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, Ambassador Chuteo, whom I always respect in many ways, so thank you for your nice introduction as well. And uh, Honorable Joseph, Robert Joseph, and uh, Robert King, and Roberta Cohen, and Christine Broker and Victor Cha and many others. Thank you for having me here today. First, I'd like to offer my sincere congratulations to the your event, which is, I believe, hosted by US Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. And uh, there is a uh, commemorating the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the UNCOI. Well, on March 21st, 
2013, the UN High Human Rights Council in Geneva adopted a resolution on the North Korean human rights situation. That resolution was passed by consensus of 47 member states without a vote, which indicated a representative decision-making method for issues, clear causes in multilateral meetings. Although different from unanimity, this consensus method shows the international community's serious concern for North Korean human rights. The most noteworthy as aspect of this resolution at the time was the establishment of the COI, which was a valuable outcome of the tireless collective effort of NGOs at home and abroad and internationally eminent human rights organizations and United Nations officials. Now, a decade later, the human rights situation in North Korea is unfortunately still very grave and miserable. The Economist Intelligence Unit, EIU's 2022 Democracy Index, for instance, ranked North Korea 165th among 167 countries evaluated. Similarly, Freedom House's World Freedom Index gave North Korea a score of only three out of 100 for political and civil rights. These indicators clearly demonstrate the extent of the human rights crisis in North Korea. The gravity of the food crisis in North Korea cannot be overstated, with reports suggesting that a significant number of the people in major cities such as Kaesong are succumbing to starvation daily. Despite this dire situation, I deplore and criticize the Kim Jong-un regime for its disregard of the basic human rights and welfare of its citizens, prioritizing nuclear and missile development instead. As North Korean human rights issues encompasses a wide range of issues, not only internal human rights problems within North Korea, I, I briefly mentioned now, we need to pay attention to the plight of North Korean defectors and workers abroad, as well as concerns related to wartime and post-war abductions, detentions, and prisoners of war. Indeed, it is very important to cover all these North Korean human rights issues and evaluate in detail what achievements have been made, what are the limitations and challenges, and what should be future tasks while we celebrate the 10th anniversary of COI. Yoon suk government has voiced grave apprehensions over the deteriorating state of North Korean human rights. President Yoon himself firmly stated that irrespective of circumstances, universal values of human rights must be upheld. Furthermore, there are concerted efforts to collaborate with the international community to enhance human rights in North Korea. On February 7th, Ms. Chung Park, Deputy U.S. Special Representative for North Korea and myself, openly hold a roundtable discussion where we listen to and empathize with family members of detainees, abductees, and POWs. Chung Park and I agree that that event marks the beginning, only beginning of the ongoing efforts by the Korean and U.S. government to address the abduction issues. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the U.S. government's active role in addressing North Korean human rights issues and looking forward to closer cooperation. And warmly welcome the nomination of Julie Turner for the U.S. Special Envoy, just like Ambassador Cho Taehyung has mentioned now as well. Additionally, it's worth noting that the international community is currently engaged in discussions about ensuing accountability for human rights violation in North Korea. Recently, the Office of the High Representative of High Commissioner for the United Nations published a report titled Promoting Accountability in the DPRK, which further highlights these ongoing efforts. I think all those international solidarity and cooperation should be strengthened in order to address uh, and on, in order to overcome the fatigue phenomena of North Korean human rights issues. Still, along with such solidarity offer of the international community, what is absolutely necessary is 
so-called depoliticization of North Korean human rights issue within South Korea. It is a shame and pity that public opinion and particularly the political circles are too divided due to the approaches and or perception of North Korea itself. So even when it comes to human rights issues, we are very divisive, while those human rights issues should be approached from the standpoint of universal values. This year, the 10th year since the COI was established, and next year, the 10th year since the COI report was published, I sincerely hope that North Korean human rights problems will be evaluated by accumulating hard evidence and through rigor rigorous analysis and evaluation, and the international community will work tirelessly to find good approaches and solutions by cooperating and struggling with each other. So those international support and international pressure on solving North Korean human rights issue should be a stepping stone for making uh, internationalization or publicization of the North Korean human rights issues. And then in Korea, regardless of the, any types of the leadership and the regime, I think we should mainstreaming the human rights, North Korean human rights issues. I believe that today's meeting of human, the, this commission, one of the first of the such efforts will set a good exemplary beginning for many similar events to come in the next couple of years. For that, I would like to thank and then I would like to emphasize what we should actively promote the purpose of importance of the COI internationally through the banners of so-called COI plus 10 and to elicit empathy and collective action from not only like-minded but also non-like-minded countries. For that, I would like you to think about two key uh, questions. What were the most serious issues among the human rights violation in North Korea at the time and why? And how has the severe violation improved now, 10 years later? Did it get worse or better? Why do we think it has improved and worsened? What were the most important suggestions that COI proposed for or called for improving human rights in North Korea? Have any of the COI suggestions improved North Korean human rights? What should be the international community do to make even a little more of these suggestions in the future? Is the COI suggestion still valid and relevant for improving human rights in North Korea after 10 years? Reflecting the current situation, what additional suggestions in addition to COI's existing proposals will effectively approach the issue of improving human rights in North Korea or North Korean human rights issues? In order to further activate the international public debate on North Korean human rights issues, I would like to highlight that in celebration of the 75th anniversary of UN Declaration on Human Rights, I, as an ambassador of international cooperation on North Korean human rights, would like to highlight the North Korean human rights issue within universal human rights throughout the year 2023. I also want to prevent North Korea's reckless and dangerous mislaunches and possible nuclear tests from sidelining human rights issues. Therefore, I would like to inform the international community of the seriousness and urgency of the North Korea's military threats and human rights abuses are directly related to uh, directly related as two sides of the same coin. Having said that, once again, I would like to congratulate today's event, and I sincerely hope that today's pro productive discussion will be held and serve as an opportunity to revitalize the discussion on North Korean human rights accountability. Thank you so much. Um. Ambassador Joseph was on the Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, reporting directly to the Secretary of State. Um, he has served on the National Security Council as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director of Proliferation Strategy, Counterproliferation, and Homeland Defense. Uh, he uh, has also been Principal Deputy Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Forces and Arms Control. And direct this proliferation research at the National Defense University um, is the recipient of multiple medals and awards. Also, most importantly, Ambassador Joseph 
is the leader of our project addressing a new approach to North Korea policy, a new approach to possible negotiations with North Korea, a human rights upfront approach, a human rights first approach. Ambassador Joseph, the floor is yours, please, sir. Well, good morning, everyone. Greg has asked me to do two things. First, I want to be brief, and second, to be diplomatic. I'll be brief. <laughs> Greg, I think you've done a remarkable job once again in putting together this very important conference. Uh, most of all, thank you for all of the great work that you do to advance the cause of human rights in North Korea. Mr. Ambassador, Madam Ambassador, if she's, if she's still with us, I uh, thank you for your attendance. I think uh, you have provided us with some very thoughtful uh, and in many ways encouraging uh, remarks. And I think your presence here today sends a very important signal. It signals that the Republic of Korea has now established as a priority, as a policy priority, the promotion of human rights in North Korea. And let me tell you that is a very welcome change uh, on many different levels. As an HRNK board member, let me just welcome everybody uh, uh, to our uh, symposium today. Uh, this, the central theme of today's event is the need to alter, in a very fundamental way, U.S. and South Korean policy towards the North, to promote an understanding and the need for a paradigm shift away from 30 years of failed policy to an approach that will place human rights up front in our dealings with Pyongyang, not solely for the sake of human rights, but also as an effective means to achieve our national security objectives, including, as the ambassador pointed out, denuclearization. There will be panel discussions focusing on this new approach for meeting the many threats from the North Korean, North Korean regime. Starting last fall, I have the good fortune of working with a number of experts in the fields of national security policy and human rights in a very collaborative effort to design a new strategy based on an easily understood proposition, and that is to be successful, we must use, we must in fact integrate all tools of state value, diplomacy, defense, economic information, and others into a comprehensive strategy that has been so lacking for so many years. Most of the members of our strategy group are here today and will participate in the panel discussions, allowing us to explore this concept in detail and put forth an alternative approach. I think we can all agree that we have tested Einstein's proposition far too long, that is pursuing the same failed policies over and over and expecting a different result approaches in Saturday. For now, let me leave you with one thought, and that is how can we best explain repeated past failures to achieve our goals, whether those were denuclearization, the advancement of human rights, or creating more stable and peaceful conditions on the peninsula. Here I would remind you of a phrase, really it's a, a principle, that all of us are familiar with. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. These words date back at least to Aristotle, if I remember my Greek classes, uh, and convey an easily understandable, logical, and straightforward proposition with relevance to many different areas of endeavor. But for, a lack, for at least the last three decades, we have failed to observe this principle in our policy toward North Korea, where instead of seeking to integrate the tools of statecraft, we have treated them in isolation, placing them in separate autonomous silos without the benefit of combining the instruments to achieve our objectives. In fact, the situation is actually worse. Again and again, for the sake of convincing the Kim regime to abandon its nuclear weapons. U.S. and South Korean policy has undercut the contribution that other tools can make to achieve our ends. Here, just think about the previous U.S. administration's canceling of military exercises, or the previous South Korean government's passing laws 
and taking other actions that seriously impeded efforts to promote human rights in North Korea. This was appeasement, pure and simple. And we all know from the lessons of history about the failure of policies of appeasement. The result has been an accelerated growth in the nuclear and missile threats we face and the continuing brutal repression of the people of North Korea who suffer as great today in terms of their in, in terms of the indignities uh, than 10 years ago. So as we move forward in our panel discussions, I hope you will be convinced of the need for a fundamental shift in policy and a new strategy that will combine containment, deterrence and defense and human rights up front. There is no easy solution to the difficult challenges we face. It will require leadership, it will require patience, and it will require strength. But we must start with the recognition that continuing to practice failed policies will only bring more failure and even greater dangers. Today's event will demonstrate that there is a viable alternative to achieving our national security goals and the advancement of the rights and the dignity of the North Korean people. Thank you very much. See our next panel, Ambassador Tron, and all means to put you on the spot. We'll be saved up. We'll see you next to Ambassador Cho. Yes, you sir. And all access is an issue, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, we're not ready for our next panel. The UNCOI, 10 years later, assessments, problems, prospects. Let me invite HRK uh, co chair emeritus Roberta Cohen to join the panel. And also Ambassador Robert King, former special envoy for the human rights situation in North Korea, please. And I will be moderating this panel. We'll also be joined virtually from New York City by Kristen Broker, Deputy Director of the Jacob Blaustein Institute, JBI, an institution that's very much done a lot of great work together. So, uh, Roberta, if you don't mind, I'm going to invite you to open the session. Roberta Cohen is co-chair emeritus of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, a specialist in human rights, humanitarian, and refugee issues. Um, she has been with NGOs, the State Department, the United Nations, the Brookings Institution. Uh, she was uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Security and Economic Assistance in the Department of State's first Human Rights Bureau. Um, she has also served as senior advisor to the U.S. delegation to the U.N. General Assembly and the Human Rights Commission, also as representative of the U.N. Secretary General on Internal Displaced Persons, uh, Roberta Cohen co won together with Francis Dang, the Gromeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order. Um, uh, Roberta and, um, and uh, Francis Dang basically internationalized the issue of internally displaced persons, IDPs. I have to mention this because we are the Doc Dr. Bacon House. Uh, Roberta was presented with a Doc Horse 50th Anniversary Award for Exemplary Writing on Foreign Affairs and Diplomacy. Uh, she has also co-directed the Brookings Institution Project on International Displacement, and of course, Roberta has been very active working with HRNK, a true blessing to, uh, to have her on the board and now as co-chair emeritus. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Greg. Please, it's on all of our Good morning to everyone, and a great thanks to HRNK for uh, as Ambassador Li Xinhua pointed out, being one of the first uh, to have a program uh, for 10 years of the first adoption of the Commission of Inquiry uh, in North Korean human rights. First, let me say a few words about the COI report itself, and then turn to some of the steps uh, that might be useful. I think Ambassador Lee left us with a bunch of questions. Some of them I'll, I'll try to respond to. Uh, if there's any document that's the gold standard reference for human rights in North Korea, it's the COI report, a report of nearly 400 pages. And although 10 years old, it continues to serve as the foundation for understanding 
what the North Korean population has had to endure uh, since the Kim Jong Un. It's extensive evidence, broad scope, highly organized material, witness testimony, documented findings, and carefully crafted recommendations will certainly feature heavily in any trials that are held in future to hold accountable those responsible for the many crimes against humanity the report found. I hope that everyone here has actually read the report or at least the summary of that report. I would recommend your reading the letter attached to it from the chair of the commission, Michael Kirby, to Kim Jong-un. And it identifies the government departments associated with crimes against humanity and whose officials are under the control of the Workers' Party, the National Defense Commission, and the Supreme Leader himself. Although it took until 2013, 60 years, into this dictatorship before the UN called for an in-depth investigation. The COI in the course of the year made the United Nations the world's principal forum for addressing the human rights situation. Uh, consider the challenges uh, which South Korean Ambassador Cho began to, to mention uh, access to the country was barred. There was no credible media or civil society existed. The information seeping out through the factors was not always verifiable. The COA, COI nonetheless brought together hundreds of witnesses, satellite imagery, government NGO and expert testimony, and managed to cover a broad spectrum of human rights. Uh, everyone expected the COI to report on prison camps, public executions, international abductions, and they did it extensively. But it also looked into government control over food and found that many of the policies and decisions during the Great Famine were taken on political grounds with, quote, full awareness that they would exacerbate starvation, end quote, and cause deaths. It further found that some of the food policies that could lead to crimes against humanity remain in place today. The prioritizing of military spending, privileging certain groups and parts of the country, evading meaningful agricultural reforms, providing misleading information, and so forth. The COI report was also unique in directly implicating China for possibly aiding or abetting crimes against humanity by forcibly repatriating North Koreans who once back in their country were going to be subject to beatings, forced labor, torture, even execution. Although the recommendation in the report that got the most publicity was that the Security Council should refer the situation to the International Criminal Court. The report also called for engagement with North Korea through dialogue with government officials, people-to-people -people exchanges, contacts in the economic area, joint academic, sports and women's programs. And it urged governments, the UN, business enterprises, foundations, and civil society to become involved so that North Koreans have opportunities to exchange information and be exposed to experiences outside their country. How can we on the 10th anniversary next year to do justice to this report, in particular to its implementation, when the North Korean people are so isolated, most recently because of the restrictions from the pandemic, when North Korea has become so closely aligned with China and Russia, 
and when the international political environment has become so challenging. One way I think to address this question is to bear in mind that if change is to come to North Korea, it will undoubtedly come from within the country and from the exposure of its people to information from outside, from the outside world. It may be pedestrian to suggest, but I think in addition to recirculating the report uh, and its 21 page, page summary, that there should be a popular version of the conclusions and recommendations that should be printed beginning with the COI words, quote, the people of the DPRK have suffered too long. It is the responsibility of the international community to protect them from the depredations of their own government. Then would follow seven pages of conclusions and recommendations, or even just recommendations, reprinted in readable letters. Uh, with colors and fonts and a foreword by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and translated into Korean and other languages. The aim would be to <clears throat> refocus global attention on the COI's findings, which are still relevant today, widely disseminate them and explore ways to get copies to North Koreans working outside the country and into North Korea by broadcast, even hearing about the document, not even seeing it, could have a ripple effect. A second, an update to the COI report would be useful to answer the questions that is repeatedly asked. Has the situation worsened since the COI report? Uh, a UN assessment would look at the impact of North Korea's pandemic restrictions on food, medical care, and other rights, and the extent to which the government is using these restrictions to enlarge its own political controls. Issues not covered by the COI report should be included, like North Korea's treatment of workers it sends abroad, and its holdings of foreigners in detention in particular six South Koreans, about which I think more should be said. An update would also identify any progress. There have been unverified reports of some reforms in the treatment of detainees that really needs looking at. Also, there have been reforms reported with regard to the disabled, children, women's health, even the most minimal reforms seem to be the result of international pressure and engagement, which speaks to the importance of the COI report, other human rights reports, and human rights processes. Uh, third, in response to the dire food and medical conditions reported, and because of the extreme isolation, every effort should be made to bring back humanitarian aid agencies to North Korea. The COI recommended that these agencies have access to prisons. And in 2019, North Korea actually accepted at a UN review process that humanitarian agencies should have access to all vulnerable groups, including prisoners. If back on the ground, I would agree that humanitarian agencies make a special effort to better integrate human rights concerns into their work. Fourth, let's turn to the UN's political bodies to keep up the visibility around the North Korean human rights issue. A strong coalition of states is essential. Now that both South Korea and the US are once again giving priority to human rights, in North Korea and have designated special envoys. They should give priority to getting the votes for convening an official public Security Council meeting on North Korean human rights. There has not been one 
on North Korean human rights for more than five years. And I do want to mention that those years ago, we can thank Bob King uh, for being one of the drivers of having such a meeting. Reaching out to Latin American and to African states will need a strategy and some leverage in order to get the nine procedural votes required for this meeting. What will a Security Council meeting accomplish? It will demonstrate the linkage between the nature of the North Korean regime and international peace and security. It will bring to the fore that a more open society in the North is crucial for lasting peace. And that the information blockade around the country needs to be countered because it is a major obstacle to peace. A Security Council meeting will also draw attention to the need for laying the groundwork for accountability. To be sure, China and Russia will veto referral of the case to the International Criminal Court. But accountability also includes other approaches, such as targeted sanctions against individuals and groups, which the COI called for and can be carried out by national governments. Universal jurisdiction, filing civil claims for monetary rewards, creating compensation funds for victims and families. North Korea has been unnerved in the past by a focus on accountability. It calls into question the Kim regime's legitimacy. And as a result, North Korea has participated at times in some of the UN human rights processes, revised some laws, and instituted some internal reforms, publicity about accountability might still have effect. A coalition working together with the UN could try to develop a strategy for safe passage for the close to 1,000 North Koreans currently held in detention in China after having fled their country. Chinese officials told the previous UN Rapporteur on Human Rights in North Korea last year not to talk about this situation, which obviously embarrasses them. Finally, a coalition could press for UN application of the human rights upfront approach. That's a UN policy, first introduced in 2013 under Secretary General Ban Ki-moon which calls for the engagement of the entire UN system, political, humanitarian development, in the face of the most grave human rights violations. The COI report calls for the application of this unified approach to North Korea. Of course, one could debate whether these or other strategies can produce results and whether China and Russia's increased backing of North Korea is making North Korea more impervious to pressure. But sidelining the human rights issue will certainly not lead to reform or to de denuclearization and will betray the people of the country. North Korea is afraid of the people in its country. Its most recent legal reforms reflect that. Our goal must be, must be to act as a voice for those people and help them plant the seeds that can help loosen the regime's grip on their lives. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Roberta. Pastor Robert King has served as a special envoy for North Korean human rights issues at the U.S. Department of State for uh, eight years, um, appointed President Barack Obama and confirmed by uh, the U.S. Senate. Again, most importantly, is also a member of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, HRNK. Previously, 
Uh, Ambassador King was staff director of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Chairman Tom Lantos and Al Berman. Uh, he was also uh, chief of staff to uh, Representative Tom Lantos, who was, remember, the only Holocaust survivor to sit in the U.S. Congress. As a White House fellow, he was a member of the, uh, the National Security Council staff working with uh, Dr. Spigna Brzezinski. Um, and also Assistant Director of Research and Senior Analyst at Radio Free Europe in Munich. We saw this coming, Bob has written a book on the history of the Romanian Communist Party. He hails from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He holds a PhD from Fletcher uh, and a BA in Political Science from Brigham Young University. Um, Ambassador King has been awarded the Knights Cross Order of Merit by the President of the Republic of Hungary. Bob, we have to work on those Romanians, I promise you. Um, to make it happen. <laughs> so, sir, please go ahead. Greg uh, failed to mention uh, that he is also a graduate of the Fletcher School, and he has a special interest in Romania. So our interests and our camaraderie go well beyond North Korea. Uh, let me, uh, on this 10th anniversary, uh, reflect on some of the developments and the U.S. role uh, in the creation of the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, as we look back on that 10-year period, I think there's some important things in terms of what this says about the United States and, and what we've done and what we uh, hopefully can continue to do to move forward on North Korean human rights issues. Uh, as Greg mentioned, I was uh, on the uh, staff of the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, I was there at the time the North Korea Human Rights Act was enacted in 2004. Uh, I was also there in 2008 when the legislation was uh, reauthorized and uh, extended. It was at that point that the U.S. Special Envoy for North Korea Human Rights Issues was designated a, an ambassadorial rank position and uh, required uh, confirmation of the Senate and uh, more specific instructions were written in the legislation to give that position some importance. Uh, I didn't know at the time that we were drafting the legislation that I was going to end up in that position. There are probably a few other changes that I would have made if I had realized I was going to be doing it. Uh, one of the uh, uh, very important parts of the uh, adoption of the uh, North Korea Human Rights Act was to emphasize that there was a strong interest in the human rights issues. Uh, North Korea was primarily seen as a nuclear problem, a security issue, uh, but the Human Rights Act emphasized that human rights was an important part of that proposal. One of the things that's interesting is when the legislation was first introduced, it was adopted by uh, overwhelming support. Uh, during the course of the North Korean Human Rights Act's initial adoption and subsequent reauthorization every uh, four or five years, the legislation has to be reapproved and extended. Uh, one of the things that has been uh, particularly important is that this has been done overwhelmingly by bipartisan support. Uh, there's only one vote taken on the legislation that was primarily to make sure that people showed up in the House of Representatives that day. Uh, there was one person who voted against it. The rest of the times the legislation has been considered, it has been adopted by either unanimous consent or by uh, voice vote. Uh, so this is an issue that reflects a very strong interest and concern on the part of the Congress of the United States, and it goes well beyond uh, political differences in many other areas. The uh, change, uh, one of the changes that was made uh, was the special envoy for North Korea human rights issues was to be a special uh, Appointment of, uh, an appointment of the president. It was to require Senate confirmation and it was to be a full time position. Uh, the concern was to make sure that we had a focus and an effort to deal with the human rights issue. One of the things that 
I began uh, dealing with very early on was the importance of the United Nations and the role of the UN in encouraging human rights. Uh, I made a point of being in Geneva every March when North Korea's human rights issues were taken up. Uh, I made a point of making sure that those issues were seen in the United States and given attention here. And I think it was particularly important that we uh, undertook that, that effort. The United States, the United States supported the creation of the Commission of, the, of Inquiry uh, when the vote was taken in Geneva. That was not something that was immediately uh, done by the United States. There was some discussion as to whether we should support it. Uh, those who supported concerns about human rights within the U.S. government were totally supported and recognized the value and the importance and the need for this legislation. There were people who were primarily concerned about security, and they were concerned that this could create difficulties or problems. Uh, the one thing that was an important part of our effort to deal with North Korea, human rights, uh, North Korea uh, nuclear issues was to make sure that sanctions uh, approved by the United Nations were kept in place. Uh, those were sanctions that were required uh, the consensus of the the five major powers and majority of the Security Council. Uh, China and Russia were supportive of the sanctions on North Korea because of its nuclear missile program. And the concern was if we pressed on human rights and if we push on that issue, uh, particularly in the United Nations, that was going to create problems uh, for what we were trying to do in security. Uh, I made the argument that that was ridiculous. Uh, and fortunately, we ended up with a designation, the creation, the establishment of the Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, when the commission was created, uh, it was, uh, as Roberta and others mentioned, uh, a unanimous action. It was uh, something that the Human Rights Council fully supported. Uh, it was a step forward, seen as being valuable and important. And uh, that was, I think, an important beginning because it showed the strength of support for the creation of the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, when we were involved, uh, when the United States participated in uh, establishing the, uh, uh, the Commission, uh, there was uh, a very strong support for what was being done in July uh, of uh, 2013, shortly after the commission was created. The three members who were on the commission were named. Uh, we had a, what we would call a Zoom call these days, but Zoom didn't exist then. Uh, we had a conversation with uh, several uh, American uh, official State Department with those uh, new appointees. We established a relationship with the commission. We offered assistance, we provided help. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do was to invite the commission to the United States. Uh, we arranged for two days of public sessions. They were held at uh, Johns Hopkins Sice uh, campus. Uh, there were a number of American specialists on North Korea who testified, talked about human rights, the relationship with human rights to other issues in North Korea. We also had a number of uh, North Koreans who were in, living in the United States who testified and participated in the conference. This was all televised and uh, was made available uh, not only to the commission, but also in terms of keeping other people informed uh, as to what was going on with, with the creation of the commission. Uh, when the uh, commission report was issued in 2014, the United States sought to call attention to the report and do what we could in terms of emphasizing the human rights problems. Uh, one of the things that we did, Secretary of State John Kerry held a meeting in New York, uh, invited a number of other countries to participate. 
uh, including the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations. We had uh, a number of uh, foreign ministers from other countries who participated in this meeting. Uh, this was an effort to give the report legitimacy, credibility, and visibility. And I think it's been an important element in terms of uh, what we tried to do with uh, with working uh, on on the uh, commission report. Uh, we've now had ten years, or so. we're approaching ten years since the report's decision was uh, was adopted. Uh, the question is, uh, was the effort worth it? Did it do what we wanted it to do? And what can we do to improve uh, the effort of dealing with human rights in North Korea. Uh, one of the problems with the report is that it's hard to assess fully what's going on in North Korea. Uh, and that's become increasingly difficult to be had once the access to information going on inside the country. But when we were looking at the impact of the report when it was published, uh, there was a real question about whether we could make a difference. Marzuki Darasman uh, approached the North Koreans. Marzuki was the special rapporteur of North Korea, uh, dealing with North Korea human rights issues with the Human Rights Council. He also was one of the leading forces behind the creation of the commission, served on the committee. Uh, he approached the North Koreans uh, on several occasions when he was. Uh, dealing with um, when he was appointed a uh, special rapporteur, uh, and the North Koreans uh, didn't even bother to respond to his request. The Chinese uh, were at least willing to say, no, thank you, we don't want you to come. Uh, North Koreans wouldn't even respond. Uh, Darusman, uh, as he was about to make his report to the General Assembly, the third committee, uh, the North Koreans said, would you like to come to North Korea? And Darusman said, of course. Uh, let's, uh, there are several issues I'd like to look at. North Koreans said, well, you can come, but these are the conditions. Uh, Marzuki and I had lunch in New York uh, as the process was going on, as he received this message from the North Koreans. We talked about what the North Koreans were trying to do, how they were trying to hijack the, uh, the process, and the conditions that they were imposing were problematic. Marzuki said, my feeling is that if I accept the invitation, uh, it will undermine what we've tried to do with the commission. And uh, I agree with him completely. The conditions were far too restrictive. The question is, uh, what effect did it have on the North Koreans? The first thing that I think is important is the North Koreans did recognize that this was a serious issue for them to deal with. Uh, the North Koreans, uh, at the time the report was issued and was being considered in the General Assembly, as you know, in New York in September, there's a week when they have the high level discussions uh, of foreign ministers from most countries are there, occasionally there are heads of state. Uh, and the question was, um, would the North Koreans participate? North Korea had not sent a high level official to New York for 11 years. In 2014, when the report came out, the foreign minister was in New York. Uh, not only that, the first time he made himself available for a session with the Council on Foreign Relations, the first time that had happened. The North Koreans were concerned about what was going on, and they were acting and trying to deal with the issue. North Koreans did not invite uh, a special rapporteur to come to. North Korea under conditions that he could accept. But there were several other, Marzuki was working behind the scenes to encourage others to approach the North Koreans. And the North Koreans agreed to have 
the representative uh, the special rapporteur on persons with disabilities coming to North Korea. She came, she was allowed to meet with uh, people in Pyongyang. She was somewhat uh, circumscribed in terms of what she was able to do, but she was there and she raised the issue of human rights of persons with disabilities. A politically non-sensitive topic, but one in which the UN role in dealing with human rights was recognized because she was invited to come to the UN and, and participate. The uh, North Koreans and all members of the UN uh, go through a process called the Universal Periodic Review. The uh, so-called UPR uh, takes place in Geneva in the Human Rights Council. Every country goes through this process. Uh, every country does a self-evaluation uh, of how well they've done their, uh, on their human rights. And then that's followed by uh, questions and comments from uh, non-government organizations and other countries raising questions about human rights. The United States goes through the process. We say these are things that we've done uh, and other countries then comment on what they think the U.S. record on human rights is. Uh, the North, uh, and, and it's a very formal process. Countries ask specific questions, uh, and then they're all put together, and then the country that uh, is being reviewed responds. Uh, North Korea had gone through this process uh, initially, uh, I think it was in 2009. They did it the second time in 2014, just after this uh, commission inquiry report came out. Uh, the North Koreans, the first time they went through the process, were asked um, 200 questions from various countries, issues they should look at, things they should do to improve their human rights record. And the, the North Koreans said, uh, we reject X number of these questions as being political and not related to human rights. And the others are questions that we will look at and give a response. Uh, they didn't bother to give a response. Uh, most other countries would respond to all of the questions they were asked. Uh, in 2014, as the report came out, as North Korea was criticized, the, the North Koreans went through this universal periodic review process, and there were a large number of questions that were asked uh, that were related to the uh, Human Rights Commission. Uh, and, uh, the one thing that was interesting is the North Koreans responded to every question that was asked. And they went back four years earlier and looked at the questions they ignored four years before. The North Koreans were concerned about what the effect was. Well, the question now is the North Koreans did have some, it did have some effect to have this report. Uh, the North Koreans uh, continue to deny that there are human rights problems in North Korea. Uh, there hasn't been the kind of high level attention that the commission report brought. And the question is, uh, does it make sense to continue? Is it worth the effort? The one thing that I think we need to remember is that we are very patient. We want to get something done and move on. With human rights and particularly dealing with human rights in North Korea, that isn't something that you solve by saying, This is the problem here, let's fix it and move on. You got to keep up the pressure. And we need to continue to press the North Koreans on these human rights issues. The Commission of Inquiry was an important beginning. We need to continue with the special rapporteur and examining those reports and continue to deal with these kinds of issues uh, in order to urge and press and encourage the North Koreans to move in a more positive direction. It's not something that's going to happen overnight, but the North Koreans need to know that we are not backing down on these issues and we need to continue the pressure. Uh, we're, we have lots of time for you to ask questions, so I'm going to stop right here and, and hope we'll have some interesting questions on that later. Nice to meet you, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, 
Our next speaker represents uh, JEI, the Jacob Lachman Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights. I often hear this question, do you collaborate with other organizations? Yes, and JEI is our, by far our closest partner and ally. Krista Broker is the Deputy Director at JEI. Um, um, she's based in New York. JEI is based in New York. JBI focuses on strengthening the effectiveness of United Nations human rights and genocide prevention mechanisms and improving the UN system's response to particularly serious human rights situations, including in North Korea, through research and advocacy. Um, Kristen received her JD and LLM in International Legal Studies from the New York University School of Law, where she was a scholar at the Institute for International Law and Justice. She's joining us virtually today by a what a wonderful world. Uh, Kristen, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, absolutely. So the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Greg. It is really a pleasure to be able to join you, um, and particularly given the weather, this virtual uh, setup has been, would have been necessary under any circumstance. Uh, it uh, it's it's always a pleasure to uh, hear from Roberta Cohen and uh, Ambassador Bob King, um, and it's my pleasure to follow their remarks. It's also my challenge, um, as I'll try not to be too duplicative in reviewing. Uh, some of the some of the areas in which JBI's contribution um, to the really outstanding efforts of HRNK of the U.S. government um, and of partners uh, in the United States and around the world to uh, bring about the creation of the COI and then promote its. Uh, the implementation of its important recommendations. It's a story I'm happy to be able to review in uh, uh, as much brevity as I can and to reflect on what we have been doing um, together with HRNK and in our own capacity uh, to advance not only the key recommendations of the North Korea COI, but also broader structural changes at the UN that we are convinced are necessary in order for it to play the indispensable role that it can in supporting the efforts um, shared by all of you to bring to light the egregious right situation in North Korea and mobilize concerted international attention to finally address it. Uh, first, a word of introduction about JBI. Uh, as Greg mentioned, we're based in New York. We are, uh, we've existed for 50 years. We're named in honor of a past president of the American Jewish Committee who represented that organization at the founding conference of the United Nations. And then later in life sought successfully for the US government, not only to champion first the inclusion of human rights in the UN charter, but for the US government to uh, consider supporting a proposal to create the post of high commissioner for human rights at the United Nations. Uh, we first began our concerted engagement on human rights in North Korea in 2012, so late in the game in terms of the steps required to bring about the creation of the COI. But from the outset, our work in this area was together with HRNK and specifically facilitated by um, the indomitable Roberta Cohen. Um, in February of 2012, JBI held a major conference on the post of High Commissioner for Human Rights, given our longstanding institutional interest in the creation of that position, to review its accomplishments and challenges that it continued to face and promote better uh, UN action to address particularly serious human rights situations around the world. Um, Roberta addressed that conference on the human rights situation in North Korea, which was attended by then High Commissioner Navi Pillai. Uh, she conveyed to the High Commissioner the sense that we shared, of course, that it was intolerable that the UN had not yet recognized the severity of the human rights situation in the DPRK so many years after evidence of that situation had come to light. Uh, she successfully pressed uh, Ms. Pillay and her staff to 
reconsider their reluctance to make determinations about human rights conditions in that country, and particularly their reluctance to rely on the basis of testimony from relatively few uh, North Korean escapees that they had been able to meet. Um, this is an effort that was being simultaneously undertaken by many NGOs. Um, in April 2012, we co-sponsored HRNK's major conference on dismantling North Korea's network of political prisoner camps, Hidden Gulag, which launched the groundbreaking 200-page uh, report by David Hawke about the camps based on both eyewitness testimony and satellite images. And that, that was the conference where Marzuki Darusman, the special rapporteur, uh, endorsed the NGO proposal for the UN Human Rights Council to create the Commission of Inquiry um, on North Korea for the first time. And then that was followed uh, several months later by High Commissioner Nave Pillay also expressing her support for the creation of the COI and then its creation by consensus, as was mentioned by the Human Rights Council. Now, following the publication of the COI's seminal report, we primarily focused from JBI's perspective on advancing its recommendations that were directed at the UN's intergovernmental bodies and at the UN system itself. And specifically, the COI's call on the Security Council to act on the situation and for the Secretary General to apply the newly announced Rights Up Front initiative to the work of all UN agencies operating in North Korea. We convened an expert roundtable to follow up on the COI report in New York in February 2014 that brought together uh, HRNK, independent human rights experts, diplomats from many member states to discuss the implementation, the, the implications of the COI's findings and its recommendations for UN actors in New York specifically. And after 2014, we collaborated with HRNK on a number of projects that were aimed at ensuring that the UN General Assembly, the Security Council, and the UN system actors would respond effectively and specifically to those COI reports recommendations. That included an advocacy campaign at the General Assembly. It in included helping to convene with other NGOs, a side event at the UN at, with head, at headquarters with testimony from um, Judge Kirby, uh, COI chairman, from uh, former North Korean political prisoners, bilateral meetings with uh, swing states, uh, key missions, and eventually resulted in the providing strong support for the General Assembly to adopt a resolution that fully endorsed the COI report and its recommendations. Um, we also pressed then uh, uh, the secure, Security Council members to um, uh, take up the procedural recommendation to hold uh, a meeting on the human rights situation in North Korea and to add that as an agenda item on the Council and uh, then to repeat the practice, as we know, in December 2015, 16, and 17, so four times. And we also embarked on a joint project with Roberta Cohen on, on behalf of HRNK to carry out research and advocacy on the Rights Up Front initiative. That project had significant results, not, not the least of which was persuading senior UN officials who engineered that initiative to consider it applicable to North Korea at all. Uh, the Human Rights Up Front Initiative is originally conceived by its uh, by the Deputy Secretary General Jan Eliasson as applying only to emergency, uh, emerging crises, and not necessarily to chronic situations of gross abuse like in North Korea. Advocacy um, uh, with him changed his perspective, and subsequently, uh, Ms. Cohen's development of detailed recommendations to all UN system actors, UNICEF, UNDP, the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, all of which were operating on the ground or had recently in North Korea on what specific actions they could take to apply human rights up front uh, to their work in North Korea was circulated to their staff. It provoked the, meet, uh, the convening of a UN interagency task force on North Korea. And it also helped provoke then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to specifically devote further attention in his own reporting back to the UN on how UN agencies, initiatives, and activities were responding to the human rights situation in the country. And finally, the new strategic framework for cooperation that the UN was at that time negotiating with North Korea, um, uh, suddenly human rights became uh, a factor that the UN was affirmatively pushing to include in that agreement. 
Um, since that time, we've continued to encourage key states, specifically the EU, to maintain the important language that still exists in the resolution adopted annually by the General Assembly that endorses the COI's key recommendations, supporting uh, the success of special rapporteurs on North Korea to engage with NGOs in New York. And we've also pressed UN system actors and members of the UN Security Council in particular to appreciate the significance of the UN uh, Security Council's meetings on human rights in North Korea. So, you know, we've heard a lot already from our panelists on the status of implementation of the Commission of Inquiry's recommendations. Um, uh, just to add a word of uh, support to Roberta's comments about the importance of the public meetings convened by the Security Council on the situation from 2014 to 2017. The U.S. played a strong role, as Bob King mentioned, in uh, convening these meetings and, and delivering powerful statements at these meetings conveying how North Korea's flagrant disregard for human rights was so closely linked to its repeated actions reflecting disdain for the rules that ensure international security and stressing that the Security Council had an obligation to remain seized of that situation as long as those interrelated patterns of behavior persisted. It has been uh, a big loss that since 2018, rather than convening public meetings on human rights in the DPRK every December, the council has instead been discussing the issue in closed consultations under the any other business agenda item. Not only is this then not a public meeting, but the council has also stopped requesting briefings on the situation in North Korea from uh, UN human rights officials, uh, senior officials briefed at all the prior um, uh, public meetings held under that agenda item. This has occurred despite the fact that the annually adopted General Assembly resolution on North Korea uh, incur specifically encourages the Security Council to resume discussion on the situation in the DPRK and to invite OHCHR, the High Commissioner's Office, to give a briefing to the Council, including on the country's human rights situation, in light of those serious concerns. The change in format from public meetings to closed consultations has also uh, sent a troubling message to the Human Rights Office at the UN, namely that Security Council members don't consider that the ongoing evidence gathering work that OHCHR is undertaking, particularly through its office in Seoul, and which has the support of the Human Rights Council, to, to be relevant to the Security Council's work. Uh, in this is part of a broader pattern that we've seen by the Security Council. It's not exclusive to North Korea, but there's been a consistent um, uh, trend in messaging to OHCHR from the Security Council starting in 2018 that human rights situations uh, on their own are of little importance to the Security Council. And it's a narrative that they absorb and it, you can see reflected in a reluctance to affirmatively bring some information to uh, Security Council members' attention and a reluctance to affirmatively approach with requests to brief the Council on these situations. So as a result of, of the Security Council's failure not only to create a ad hoc tribunal or refer the situation in North Korea to the International Criminal Court as the COI recommended, but also its failure to then hold public meetings. Responsibility for keeping the situation on the international agenda at the UN has really shifted to the General Assembly and to the Human Rights Council. And to their credit and to the credit of the states um, that are working so hard on the resolutions taken up there, those resolutions have been adopted by consensus in recent years, even though they create a country-specific rapporteur uh, in the case of the Human Rights Council resolution and authorize an evidence-gathering mechanism that is country-specific. We can't take that consensus support for granted, and we can't take its significance lightly. Uh, it really does convey that the international community, so many members of which are increasingly reluctant and averse to country-specific scrutiny, see North Korea as uniquely troubling and uniquely deserving of international scrutiny, uh, and they continue to do so. Um, as for the UN system, as a consequence of the COI report, um, uh, we saw the Human Rights Upfront Initiative resulting in positive changes 
not only across the board for the UN system, but specifically for the UN's approach to, to, to North Korea. Well, it led to um, North Korea being considered in senior meetings that were prevention focused undertaken at UN headquarters, uh, meetings that were created as part of the Human Rights Upfront agenda, agenda called um, regional quarterly reviews. These had the effect of conveying senior UN support to the resident coordinator in the DPRK to um, be assertive in raising human rights in his interactions with his um, with his counterparts and specifically pressing him um, and supporting him in raising raising the need to include a reference to human rights in the strategic framework for cooperation between the UN and DPRK. That inclusion then provided the resident coordinator with room to maneuver human rights and specifically to raise UPR recommendations, uh, which Bob King uh, was raising, into discussions with national authorities. And the significance of that blessing from headquarters to do something provocative from the perspective of the North Korean government was indeed quite significant and a departure from some of the past practice that we've seen uh, by UN uh, leaders in the field, not only in North Korea, but in many places around the world. You know, despite this progress, the Human Rights Up Front initiative wasn't, in the end, actually capable of diminishing UN system actors' historic reluctance to confront government actors about their commission of severe human rights violations in many cases and places around the world, the most notorious of which is Myanmar, where a, a genocide occurred um, uh, only a few years after the rollout of this initiative. And perhaps we can discuss why and how the human rights upfront approach at the UN um, was not as effective as its uh, designers had hoped it would be in the Q&A. Um, but suffice to say that this these challenges were accompanied by a change in leadership at the United Nations and also by a change in approach that reflected uh, the new pressures that the uh, UN Secretariat has come under since 2018 um, concerning whether or not the Secretariat should be uh, assertive about raising human rights concerns with governments. We saw structural changes made to how the Human Rights Upfront program was implemented within the United Nations system, and particularly across the board, changes like the elimination of specific staff tasked with implementing that initiative, um, uh, a change in the instructions to UN staff to heavily prioritize raising only universal periodic review recommendations and not necessarily the recommendations for governments devised by special procedures, such as in the case of North Korea, the special rapporteur. This is a worrying development from JBI's perspective for North Korea and across the board because it suggests that uh, the UN system is responding to pressure that it's feeling from countries led by China, including Russia, that consistently stress at the UN and more vigorously now than in the years when the COI report first was published, that it's only appropriate for UN system actors to raise human rights issues with governments if they have acknowledged them and only information about human rights conditions that um, are from reliable sources, such as the government itself, can inform the UN's recommendations to a government on its human rights performance. So in sum, although we're seeing the Secretary General and the UN system asserting rhetorical support for the idea that human rights um, are essential, uh, including to international peace and security, um, we are confronted with a UN system that's less assertive now than it was um, and that it was from 2014 to 2017 in all but the most extreme cases. Um, thankfully, not all of the legacies of the COI report and its recommendations um, have been similarly uh, undermined. Uh, a clear, bright point is the special rapporteur, which has kept the spotlight on the human rights situation in the country since the COI concluded, and the OHCHR office in Seoul, which has produced great reports confirming the reality of the situation in the country, and that also forced the UN system and the secretariat to confront the reality of the situation in the country on a regular basis. 
if I might, um, just two words on what we I would consider the, the lessons learned from an NGO perspective uh, attempting to do advocacy on the COI report in New York specifically uh, over the past few years. First, that consistent government leadership, particularly from the United States in the case of the Security Council, and a commitment to dedicate diplomatic energy to ensure that multilateral institutions, and particularly the UN, are recognizing the egregious scale and severity of the ongoing human rights violations in the DPRK is essential. In the absence of consistent U.S. leadership on this point and on other key human rights concerns, we saw the collapse of the international momentum that had been needed to keep this issue on the Security Council's agenda just eviscerate with a speed that was devastating. Second, at the same time, we know that U.S. leadership is not sufficient to keep recognition of North Korea's human rights violations as a global security concern on the international agenda, we are still digging out of the hole that was created in 2018, which is when the U.S. first expressed ambivalence about continuing to pursue the U.N. Security Council meetings on the DPRK for the first time since the publication of the COI report. The current administration's clear expression of support for resuming these meetings hasn't so far been sufficient to revive the practice. And there are many reasons for this, among them that since 2017, we've seen China really using its diplomatic muscle to uh, sway the views of countries that ca consider it a, tree, a key trading partner on the uh, merits of bringing human rights concerns to the Security Council's attention. So not only must the U.S. be matching the China in terms of the diplomatic capital that it's willing to deploy on the DPRK human rights issues at the U.N., it must also persuade key allies to invest their own diplomatic capital to offset China's influence on those middle-of-the-road members of the Security Council whose support is essential if progress is to occur. It's so welcome that we saw the U.S. government recently mobilize 31 countries to sign a joint statement calling for the resumption of these Security Council Council meetings, but it's only signed by eight current UN Security Council members when, as Roberta mentioned, nine are needed to overcome the expected procedural objections from Russia and China. Third, we can't ignore the broader context in which the resistance to implementing the COI's UN-directed recommendations is occurring because of the concerted effort. Uh, among a group of countries that includes North Korea, has China at its center, but has many other components to it to redefine the normative content of human rights and the proper role of international organizations in advancing them. There are many reasons why countries are seeking to take down the temperature in their diplomatic relations with China and seeking to find ways to constructively pursue progress with it on major global challenges, and particularly at the UN, where consensus agreement is so important on so many issues. Um, and including, as Ambassador King referenced, uh, sanctions packages adopted by the Security Council. But this can't translate to passivity or acquiescence in the face of this campaign that China is spearheading to neutralize the UN as the source of targeted pressure on it or its allies to curb the specific ongoing severe human rights violations we see in North Korea, we see in China, and we see in so many other countries. Uh, if that broader effort is encountered, the risk is that you find a situation in which the UN thinks it's promoting human rights up front in North Korea in its work, but that it has limited this exclusively to recommendations that North Korea has accepted in the Universal Periodic Review Procedure. While that procedure is helpful and plays some positive roles, it, specifically with regard to North Korea and throughout the UN, it's not a substitute for independent uh, scrutiny that we see from the special rapporteur, we see from treaty bodies, that we see from the OHCHR office in Seoul. So we will continue our part and we look forward to working with HRNK and to all of you in continuing to press uh, the UN to follow through on the commitments and the promises that were made following the publication of the outstanding COI report. The 10th anniversary of the report is a perfect opportunity to call for that attention to be elevated once again, but we shouldn't underestimate the challenges that we're facing as we seek to do so. Thank you.
Brother, please uh, allow me to uh, ask you the first question, the first moderator question. Um, of course, prior to your very extensive experience addressing uh, North Korean human rights, um, you did a lot of other human rights work at the State Department dealing with uh, Argentina or the Soviet Union. Um, what relevance did that work uh, have on your current North Korea work today in the past many years? Uh, let me go back to the 1970s uh, and the Carter administration in Argentina. Uh, there were thousands and thousands of uh, citizens of Argentina being disappeared. Uh, this was men really being abducted from their homes, no charge, no trial, and they were murdered. Uh, I was asked to look at this issue um, as soon as my very first day in the Carter administration, because the person actually who was supposed to look at that issue uh, wasn't there yet. So I was steeped in Argentina. Um, what I find pertinent today that you're asking is that there uh, are two points. One, that I became heavily involved in creating the United Nations a working group on enforced disappearances. Initially, it was supposed to have been a working group on Argentina, but that was not possible politically. Um, and so we, we were able to, with a great struggle, weaving the United States and other embassies um, to create the working group on, on um, disappearances in 1980. Uh, today, that, that uh, working group remains, uh, and there are more than 300 North Korean cases of disappearances before that working group. Um, now, in this process, I, of course, had to deal with how do you maintain this issue as a priority in U.S. bilateral relations with Argentina, and that's where you begin encountering your problems uh, within the State Department, uh, particularly in light of the fact that the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan uh, and Argentina uh, was critical in this effort. Um, so how do you maintain a human rights focus, even though there are bigger my strategic interests and that I don't have the answer for, but uh, I, I saw that very clearly there and I do now. Uh, with regard to the Soviet Union, you asked about. Um, okay, this is a this is quite interesting. Um, I was the executive director of an NGO in New York, the International League for Human Rights. Uh, it had been founded by Roger Baldwin, who was the founder of the American Civil Liberties Union. And had consultative status with the UN. Uh, when I arrived uh, in Moscow, in Moscow, a human rights group had formed for the first time successfully, an NGO. There were no NGOs uh, in the Soviet Union, not on human rights. Uh, and they asked to affiliate with our organization. The head of the Moscow Human Rights Committee was Andrei Stakharov who was a nuclear scientist, later winner of the Nobel Prize. And Sakharov, who had become disenchanted uh, with the human rights situation in the country and whether a country like that should be responsible with nuclear weapons, um, but that their human rights situation had to be uh, looked at. That was the critical factor. In fact, I think uh, to Ambassador Joseph, I would mention some of Andre Sakharov's books to read or what the what you are proposing. Um, but let me say, what did Andre Sakharov want to know? We had monthly telephone calls with his right hand scientist, uh, Larry Chalitza, and also him and others. They wanted to have the texts of the UN human rights agreements that the Soviet Union had ratified. They couldn't get them in their own country. Uh, and so we would read them on the telephone, passages from paragraphs from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, from the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights. They had gotten some copies, but they were confiscated by 
by the KGB from their office as some sort of subversive material. But these were treaties the Soviet Union ratified. And when we look today at the human rights treaties that North Korea has ratified, some of these same treaties, and it's certainly unclear that anybody within North Korea is able to read them. And where is the UN in having some kind of program that would disseminate within countries the treaties that they accepted? And in addition to other human rights treaties, where does UNESCO stand? Where do other, where does the High Commissioner for Human Rights Office stand in having um, their documents go into other countries? So this was this was quite a struggle, and that's a story in itself, but that was very pertinent to what's going on. And the other part was that the Soviet Union was attacking the international human rights organizations like my own um, for slandering the Soviet Union and wanted to expel them from their consultative status in the United Nations. And this was formally proposed, and there were hearings in 1969. And I had to represent um, another organization at the UN, which I did, the International Federation for Human Rights. It's a French-based organization that was founded by René Cassin, who uh, was also, I believe, a Nobel laureate and um, was, a, was a big role, played a big role with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Well, the Soviet Union wanted to expel the Federation and other human rights organizations. And I had to go before a hearing that was held um, for, uh, for two hours to defend this organization. And the Soviet delegate, I remember, was seated at a corner from me. It was around the table. There were maybe about 12 states that were part of the NGO Committee on Human Rights that Greg has had to deal with in getting the consultant status for the HRNK to the UN. And this Soviet delegate um, banged his fist on the table when he made his point. So I was right here, and the chair did not call him out of order. Um, and I felt like taking my shoe and banging it on the table as well, uh, which Khrushchev had done earlier. Um, and so the idea of a human rights NGO of having a non-governmental organization in a country and internationally that work on human rights issues. Some of these same issues are here today with regard to North Korea. And the consultative status is a big one. Uh, I think HRIK is the first NGO dealing with a country in North Korea that got its consultative status at the UN, which uh, Greg can tell you about. But the Soviet position is now assumed by Russia. Uh, there was a period during the SOA and the end of the Cold War where their positions were different, but now they're back uh, to the way it was. And so you have the same idea that human rights information is considered slanderous. Uh, and you can hear the Russian Federation the General Assembly today uh, criticizing the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in North Korea and saying basically, uh, special rapporteurs are there to vilify governments, and there shouldn't be country specific. Uh, so it's it. Um, I was dealing with this problem in the late 60s, 1969, um, and the 70s. And so you have uh, this ongoing thread. There are changes in it and, and subtleties, but basically you will have you the same problem dealing with the uh, Soviet Union, Russian Federation, uh, with a charge. Well, that's a truly fascinating account, and yes, we are facing the same problem. It was extremely difficult to acquire consultative status, and now we have to uh, submit our quadrina reports. And uh, of course, we uh, receive follow-up questions, which are pretty much the same questions we're receiving as we were seeking consultative status from the same usual suspects. We know who they are, and of course, Russia is one of them, I suspect. Um, speaking of uh, CSOs, organizations, NGOs. Um, Bob, you were extraordinarily popular with uh, the world of NGOs. Um, 
from your perspective, how was your relationship with the CSOs in the United States, in Korea, in Japan, in Europe, and elsewhere? It seems to me that uh, when I was dealing with the North Korea human rights issues, uh, both in the United States and in South Korea in particular, there were non-government organizations that were very active and very involved on calling attention to human rights abuses in, uh, in North Korea. Uh, my sense was these were organizations that were very much doing the same thing that we wanted to see done with regard to North Korea's human rights. And it was in our interest uh, to encourage these organizations. And I made a point of, of working with uh, organizations here in the United States and uh, uh, South Korea and also a number of European organizations. Uh, when you deal with the human rights issues, uh, governments change, uh, politics change, uh, what was important to a previous uh, government is not as important to a new one. Uh, on the other hand, the NGOs tend to be quite consistent. They have a, a particular issue and they are pushing that issue and they continue to do it. Uh, and I found that there is value in having a relationship with NGOs to encourage them to work with their governments uh, to encourage movement in the right direction on the human rights. And it struck me that this was something that uh, we ought to be doing uh, uh, in terms of, of, in, of encouraging action on, the, on North Korea. And I think that's been one of the things that's been very helpful in terms of the progress. Uh, the organization's uh, HRNK has been extremely helpful in the reports that they have produced uh, identifying human rights issues, human rights problems. Uh, there are other organizations in the US and elsewhere which are very good at mobilizing support for action uh, through the United Nations and other organizations. So I think it's, it's extremely important that governments who have an interest in these kinds of human rights issues work closely with NGOs, uh, both uh, here in the United States and with other countries as well. Thank you very much, Bob. And before we go to the Q&A, Kristen, I have a question for you as well. You have provided a detailed uh, explanation of uh, the, the HRUF approach, the human rights um, upfront approach of the UN, so did Roberta an approach that combines the political, humanitarian, human rights arm. Um, of course, under the leadership of Ambassador Joseph, we and we, we've produced this report co-authored by Ambassador Joe Detrani, Colonel David Maxwell, Olivia Enos, Bob Collins, Dr. Nick Everstadt, and myself, that puts forth a human rights upfront approach that's broader, uh, that interprets this notion more liberally, perhaps more comprehensive. Uh, what are your thoughts on the traditional concept of HRUF and this more liberal interpretation put forth by HRNK? Well, Greg, first, I, I really appreciate that um, this is the uh, the approach that you're championing because it's perfectly in line with what, with what we've been championing at the UN side for so many years. Uh, as you might expect. But I, I think there are important similarities between the two approaches, um, a few very important differences, and then some lessons that you might be able to take from that not entirely positive experience that we've had at the UN with the human rights upfront approach and to see how those might be um, integrated into promoting your strategy and ensuring its, app, uh, its effectiveness. So, uh, from a from a similarities perspective, I mean, I uh, I perhaps the, the human rights advocate that I am, I read the the sentence of your report that said, "This is not the promotion of human rights solely for the sake of human rights," and instinctively bristled because obviously human rights are valuable in their own right. That being said, this is the exact same approach that underlies the UN's human rights upfront approach that. 
human rights is also an effective and the only effective means to secure international peace and security and to promote humanitarian assistance and to promote sustainable development. Uh, that's what underlies the, the UN's uh, understanding of that program, and it's what uh, underlies your own. So uh, uh, the message is the same. What's different, I think, is uh, first, the, the target entity and the limitations to which it is or is not subjected. Um, you uh, are fortunate in that the U.S. government is not in, as, as susceptible to the sort of pressure uh, that the U.N. is in the same way. And perhaps that will help uh, overcome some of the challenges that really impeded the U.N. from taking the program forward in the way that it was meant to be. Um, I alluded to the situation in Myanmar, and for those not familiar with it, um, it was devastating for, for those of us who supported the rollout of the Human Rights Upfront Initiative to see that only uh, three years after its implementation, you had a situation in which the High Commissioner for Human Rights had a human rights advisor to the country team and the country who was being sidelined. He undertook his own investigation into reports of what was happening to the Rohingya. He was screaming crimes against humanity from the rooftops. And yet other UN system actors like the UN country team and the UNHCR were not similarly publishing information that they had about human rights violations. And not only that, they were working with uh, Myanmar authorities who were maintaining what were effectively internment camps for the remaining Rohingya. They were uh, in discussing the future of the repatriation of the Rohingya with the Myanmar government as if it was an appropriate partner with which to collaborate with on decisions about their future. The performance was not what the Human Rights Upfront Initiative expected of them. And um, as one might have expected, their approach was counterproductive. It didn't stop the violence and it didn't, not, not in the short term or in the long term of su as subsequent developments um, show. And we have to ask why, like what, what developments impeded that um, program for succeeding and how can we prevent a repetition of that in um, other and related initiatives like yours? I think one major change that I alluded to was that with the change in leadership at the UN, there had been dedicated staff that were specifically tasked with ensuring like the application of a human rights upfront approach. Um, those were, yeah, the, the, the question of whether to have those staff was put to states in general. The secretary general stopped accepting donations from Western states only to fund them. And once the question was put to the entire UN membership um, to decide by consensus, China vetoed that. Um, another change was the parameters for engagement um, by the UN with uh, local authorities and shifting to like primarily or exclusively UPR recommendations. What can we learn from that in this case of your proposal? Well, first, that um, it's essential to have dedicated and senior level uh, qualified and empowered people who are specifically responsible for ensuring a human rights upfront approach is applied. And to that end, um, I just want to second the congratulations and the enthusiasm that everyone has expressed for the administration's long-awaited nomination of a special envoy for North Korean human rights, because that's not only welcome in and of its own right, but that would be an essential aspect, I think, of taking forward the approach that you are championing. What I hope it can be accompanied by are specific structural changes inside decision-making um, uh, channels within the U.S. government that will ensure that the North Korea uh, Special Envoy uh, for Human Rights is included in major discussions and that the situation of human rights and its application to U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea generally is re regularly reviewed. Um, that's something that was built into the original human rights upfront system, which would have been um, helpful in continuing its effectiveness if other changes hadn't been made. Um, finally, I think your 
your target um, puts you in a more advantageous position to actually push for more than just rhetorical um, support for human rights from from the U.S. government and to actually advance like really um, meaningful strategies for information dissemination. Um, Roberta has, of course, raised that there's a, the UN should consider itself obligated to transmit human rights information into countries, whether or not a government consents to that dissemination. But in practice, what we see is substantial hesitation to do that. And not just in North Korea, in many places where the UN is denied physical access or the ability to communicate um, in a way that the government does not want it communicating with its people from Myanmar to Syria to Ethiopia like and beyond. The U.S. government has uh, less uh, hesitance and limitations uh, on it in that respect. And I think um, really vigorously pursuing the recommendations that you set out about how to ensure um, more effectively that information about the human rights condition in the country, about conditions in uh, South Korea and about um, the reality of the regime as you've proposed it, is essential. And so um, uh, uh, I'm confident that the way that you've proposed the strategy and the target that you're approaching is going to be more sympathetic and also more capable of effectively implementing a human rights upfront strategy for North Korea. Thanks. Just the most helpful. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes left. We're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Please remember to wait for the mic. Please remember to wait for the mic. Uh, and then, if possible, please identify yourself. And also, if possible, please specify who you're addressing the question. We'll go there first. Yoshino. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Yujin from Pyongyang Daily News. And um, thanks for highlighting all the different issues of human rights. And I'd like to ask my question to Dr. Corin. Uh, you've highlighted different aspects of human rights crisis, uh, including food and medical crisis. And we are seeing reports of worsening food security situation in North Korea. Um, and at the moment, humanitarian organizations are not allowed to enter into the country. And the Kim regime is still seems very adamant in refusing international aid. So as a way to uphold and protect human rights values in North Korea, how would the U.S. and the international society, as well as South Korea government, respond to the food security situation in North Korea? Well, they definitely should be highlighting this. The refusal of North Korea to accept in uh, food aid from the outside to allow any of the organizations back on the ground uh, they have, there have been some, a few shipments isolated that have been allowed in, I think, from UNICEF. But this is a very serious situation of really rejecting uh, having a relationship with the international agencies that have been there for at least 20 years. Um, it can't all be rationalized by the pandemic. Uh, there has to be more to this. And I think part of it is a situation that is very difficult to address because it's really the international political environment, I think, that is becoming part of this. I think as far as mass starvation goes, I have the impression, but I do not have information, that China probably will allow in certain goods to prevent any kind of mass starvation in the country because that could be destabilizing, but certainly not enough to really help people with food insecurity. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult situation to be needing to demand uh, having uh, entry to countries to provide aid if they don't want the aid. You, you can't go in despite that. Um, and I think this problem ought to be much more highlighted in terms of the relationship of um, the international community to food aid, uh, to the, to the, what is behind food aid and international community help, and that North Korea may be on the verge then in doing this of what Michael Kirby and the COI Commission found during the Great Famine uh, in North Korea. The situation is not the same in terms of need, I think, 
but in terms of having policies and decisions that actually are exacerbating starvation in the country. And this seems to be fall into the range of crimes against humanity uh, and not having the programs. Right now, I think the uh, North Korean government is looking at agriculture. Are they willing to make the reforms that actually enable them to be reliant on agriculture? This is a question. Uh, but there are, uh, the previous rapporteur wanted reparations for people in North Korea that had starved during the famine because of deliberate government policies. So I think there are many ways to look at this and many ways to highlight it. And I think the food issue is one that should also be looked at in terms of criminal uh, liability in addition to humanitarian immunity. And um, it's, a, it's an extremely serious issue right now, food and medicine and getting in supplies and what this means for the government and its policy. One question there. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Jean Rui. I'm the, one of the co-founders of the Young Leader Forum of the Korean Peninsula, and at the same time, a graduate student at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Um, I have a question to Ambassador King uh, regarding, um, I think, I believe one of the most big challenges for um, international cooperation on North Korean human rights probably could probably be the, um, the politicization and polarization and by so it can cause some inconsistency of the international cooperation. So um, I have a question regarding, do you have any rec recommendations for Iraq, the South Korean government for um, how can the South Korea, US, Japan or the UN can actually um, strengthen its international cooperation? Um, um, and do you think establishing like more permanent international dialogue channel between um, countries is necessary, or yeah, that's the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for the sake of time, let's take the other question as well. And that's our final question. Now. Thank you. Um, I'm Javi Anderson from Radio Free Asia. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Cohen. Um, suppose the US and China relationships were better. In that case, do you think there could be opportunities for cooperation, not only on North Korea's nuclear issue, but also on human rights issues? You raised some interesting questions in terms of cooperation and lack of cooperation. Uh, one of the things that I think has been fairly clear is the U.S. and South Korea and Japan uh, have generally been reasonably careful about keeping each other informed. Uh, certainly when I was there, we were dealing with uh, questions of uh, assistance, uh, human rights related problems. Uh, we were always communicating. Uh, the difficulty is there are other players who are not willing to cooperate and, and communicate. Uh, China does provide some assistance to North Korea. Uh, Chinese do what they do uh, with very little information uh, coming out about what, what's actually going on. And certainly no effort to, to coordinate or cooperate with the US or, or I think with South Korea and Japan. Uh, it seems to me that the best approach is maybe working through organizations like the United Nations and some of the other organizations where other countries participate and for the United, when the United States, South Korea, Japan have uh, focused on North Korean human rights issues, it's been very easy to bring in other countries to participate as well. And I think that's probably the best way to go. Uh, Japan has traditionally taken a very important role in dealing with the North Korean issues. Uh, South Korea has been fairly cautious about publicly leading on uh, human rights issues in the UN. And that's understandable in terms of the of the uh, the relationship between North and South Korea. But to the extent that we are coordinated and cooperate and work together, uh, I think we can be much more effective. And I think that's an important element for all of our foreign policy partners. This is the question of if if uh, if China and the United States. I can only look back to the time of the six party talks that China chaired. Um, and I think there are others in the room better qualified than I am to comment on that relationship. But 
there were talks and they didn't get to the point of discussing what normalization relations would mean and the inclusion of human rights in the discussions. I didn't get to that point. So it would have been interesting. But I had an interesting experience with a Chinese official who remained nameless who came to this country um, at some point a number of years ago. Uh, he was part of the Chinese foreign ministry. And we had a private meeting with him. Uh, and um, I had never met him before, and I never imagined that he would know anything about me, but I happened to be on the food line with him uh, for the buffet, and um, we exchanged cards, and he told me he read everything I wrote, uh, and which I said to him, I thought only my husband did, but he, he said he did. But the interesting thing is I wrote only about human rights, and in the discussion, uh, he pointed to the Helsinki Convention. Uh, Helsinki idea is one that uh, one should think about, and that apparently uh, he and others in the foreign ministry are thinking about. This goes back a number of years, but that was uh, a Helsinki process that would be um, applicable to Asia, and that would involve issues that would be security and nuclear, but as well as humanitarian and human rights and uh, information, and that somehow uh, in this mixed, you had a whole range, a comprehensive approach uh, to the relationship in Korea, uh, not just dealing with nuclear matters. So there might have been a slight openness, and then it was the invited over the Chinese ambassador who came to discuss this issue of Helsinki approach. But that, um, uh, this was something that, that relates to Eastern Europe, which uh, may have been before your time. Uh, but it's very relevant. And so it was the idea of having many different subjects, including human rights, humanitarian issues. Um, and it was simply a way to try to move this forward. But um, in addition, there is the very bigger problem of what happens if there were conflict or there were a revolution on the peninsula. Um, China and the US, in terms of, if you look at it just in terms of human rights or uh, being able to deal with the nuclear element in North Korea, would Chinese troops go for? There would have to be cooperation between the United States, South Korea, and China on this such an issue. And I have always been interested in what happens to political prisoners, because in the COI report, it says that in the time of conflict or revolution, there's some sort of directive from North Korea to kill all prisoners. And I've always been trying to insert into any possible joint planning, which doesn't exist today, but it was a big question uh, of how to save or protect them. in the over 100,000 that are in health for political reasons in North Korea in terrible conditions. Thank you. So, uh... COI plus 10, charting the way forward, human rights up front, the accountability measures, the coalition of the like minded, so many great ideas. Uh, Roberta, Bob, Kristen, you have been an absolutely stellar panel, of course, as always. So please join me in uh, a big round of applause for all three panels. 1 p.m. Uh, during lunch, we'll be watching two messages. One for COI chiefs. The other one from the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Salmon. These remarks are prepared with a view to focusing attention on the priorities that should exist at this time in respect of the COI report. Now, um, the first priority is to thank the United Nations. It gets a lot of knocks in this world. But in its work on North Korea and in its work on the COI report, uh, it was excellent. We had a marvellous team in the uh, Human Rights Council Secretariat led by Giuseppe Calanduccio. I had wonderful colleagues, uh, Mazuki Darasman, the former Attorney General of Indonesia, and Sonia Berserko, a, a strong activist in human rights, from Serbia, 
Uh, and above all, we had great support from witnesses who were members of the communities in uh, the Republic of Korea and elsewhere, in Japan, in London, and in Washington, D.C., and Thailand, who came forward uh, and putting to their side any risks that they might face or their families might say, face, where we considered it reasonably safe to do so, they took part in public hearings which opened the light onto the world of North Korea. And it is that light that we must follow. We must follow the beam. Uh, a new methodology was adopted by our Commission of Inquiry. It was a methodology of transparency. Bring in the witnesses, bring in the internet, and uh, bring in the media so that the world could see uh, North Korea as others see it, and particularly those who have experienced the great wrongs that have occurred in North Korea. Uh, the uh, internet recordings of the witnesses' statements are still online, and they're available for the world to see, and I encourage anyone who hasn't already seen them to make contact with our internet recording of our public hearings and of the testimony. You know, uh, I sometimes saw uh, video or old documentaries on the post-war, post-Second World War, uh, war crimes trials starting at Nuremberg, and I never thought, as an Australian judge, that I would uh, get to a point where I was sitting in uh, a terrible repetition of what was done back in 1946, 47, 48. But that is what it was. People came forward and anxious to speak about uh, the situation in North Korea, anxious to put their experiences on record and overwhelmingly, the COI was convinced about the honesty and integrity of the witnesses uh, who came before us. Uh, the problem uh, is not in the report of the COI. It was a strong report. It came to the conclusion that uh, although uh, the crime of genocide, international crime of genocide had not been established for technical reasons, that crimes against humanity, another very great international crime, had been demonstrated in numerous heads of our mission, uh, of the uh, Commission of Inquiry mandate, uh, and those um, accusations and our findings remain before the international community relating to the political rights, the rights of women, the rights of citizens, to information, the rights to food, uh, and the rights uh, of people who were abducted to have redress for the great wrongs that were shown. Uh, the problem uh, with the report is not in its content. The problem is the low concentration span of the international community. Every day brings new perils to the international community and everybody um, who is in any way aware of the situation in the international community with uh, the invasion of Ukraine and the activities of the United Nations uh, and of allies uh, in Ukraine uh, to combat that uh, invasion will know how that is the issue, the, one of the substantial issues, probably the great substantial issue that is on the mind of the international community uh, at the moment. And therefore, in breaking through the barrier of indifference that tends to come with international affairs, we have to try to find a new way to re-engage with the uh, communities that are concerned and the international community generally concerning uh, security uh, and uh, human rights. Now, um, President Trump uh, took an initiative. It was an initiative which at the time I thought was worth taking, of having the meeting with the 
uh, representatives of uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, unfortunately, the three meetings uh, which were held with Kim Jong-un uh, led ultimately to nothing, indeed worse than nothing, because uh, when President Trump walked out of the attempt, being of the view that he could not secure a deal with North Korea, that was a great loss of face for the supreme leader of North Korea, and it probably even set the agenda back. Uh, and the basic problem was that he went straight to the really difficult, the most difficult issue, and that was the issue of nuclear weapons and rockets and security of all parts of the Korean Peninsula and the surrounding parts of the world. Uh, and uh, because that uh, interfered with uh, a proper approach, if I would call it a diplomatic approach to the uh, negotiations between uh, North Korea and the rest of the world, uh, it's probably set back the uh, endeavours which the COI wanted to see. But uh, the right way to approach uh, North Korea is, as the COI pointed out in its report, to advance at the edge of the circle. This is the way uh, negotiations have to commence, at the edge of the circle, at the uh, little steps that were necessary, albeit urgently, to um, re-engage North Korea with the rest of humanity. Uh, the opening of postal links, the opening of rail links, the creation of sister city arrangements, the sporting links. Uh, these were the ways in which, after the Second World War, the links in Germany and Austria, two other countries which were divided as a consequence of that war, were begun. And I believe, and the COI uh, expressed the view in its report, that these were the ways to start the process of re-engagement with North Korea. Uh, and I think it's a very important uh, obligation of the international community and of all of us to re-establish the relevance of uh, the Korean Peninsula in the mind of humanity, to revive interest uh, in the COI report uh, to utilize the 75th anniversary of the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, for which Eleanor Roosevelt, a great American and a great citizen of the world, played such an important part uh, in uh, 1948 in securing the statement of the universal rights. You are not going to get peace and security on the Korean Peninsula until you get a restoration of fundamental rights in North Korea. The two are integrated, but you have to approach them in a correct uh, and proportionate way. The special rapporteur, Professor Salmon, uh, and her predecessors have made every effort to establish physical link to go to North Korea, as the COI did. Uh, that has been, been denied to them as it was denied to us. But we must renew our efforts to get into North Korea and bringing the message of peace uh, and bringing the message of universal human rights and using the 75th anniversary for this purpose. Uh, every effort must be made to revive uh, the links with North Korea to um, uh, address the problems in the COI report. New consultations are needed, consultations in the first instance in the Republic of Korea, in South Korea. Those consultations should engage civil society. Uh, they should engage organizations of escapees or de defectors, as they're sometimes called, and the media uh, that will bring the message of uh, the COI report to a wider community. The media has a very important role uh, in this endeavour. Uh, it's necessary to engage the Republic of Korea. Uh, under the presidency of Moon Jae-in, the Republic of Korea 
uh, stepped back from the endeavours of the COI report, but I'm glad that the new administration is now re-engaging with the international human rights agenda of the world community. And we have somehow to get the message of the COI report over. No one is immune from the reports of the uh, international community, and in particular, the excellent report of the COI. And it's important that that message should be brought home to the uh, international community and also to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. If we can do that, if we can renew links and re-establish contact and maintain our own vigilance uh, and raise the relevancy and uh, significance of the COI report, that will be a step not only for universal human rights in this 75th anniversary year, but it will be a, a revival of the importance of universalism, uh, of uh, no uh, limitations, no exceptions, no differentiation, universal human rights for all, including for the people of North Korea. Uh, I hope that your conference will be a great success and that it will take as its focus the report of the COI on North Korea, because in that report uh, are the keys to reviving uh, universal human rights and human rights for the people of North Korea, which must be the goal of us all. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the creation of the Commission of Inquiry on the Human Rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and the upcoming year will mark the 10th anniversary of its landmark report. As we know, the COI was established by the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2013, thus answering the need of an inquiry mechanism with adequate resources to investigate and more fully document the grave, systematic and widespread violations of human rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. In retrospect, the work of the COI deserves commendation because it adequately achieved its goals of conducting in-depth investigations regarding human rights violations in the DPRK and documenting witness and other first-hand accounts of the situation in the DPRK. The reliable and critical information gathered by the COI has served to complement and delve into the issues highlighted by the Special Rapporteurs on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK. A decade after its inception, the COI's landmark report enlightens and alerts us about the progress made regarding the protection and promotion of human rights in the DPRK and the setbacks and obstacles that we need to overcome to make further improvements. The COI's final report concludes that not only grave violations of human rights have occurred in the DPRK, but also crimes against humanity. These findings placed on the agenda the possibility that high-ranking government officials could be investigated and tried by the International Criminal Court, specialized tribunals, or in national courts under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Nevertheless, it must be noted that accountability for human rights violations in the DPRK remains an issue to this day. We must be in mind that the COI's investigation went back to the very beginning of the DPRK, which means that many violations have been sustained reality for over 70 years. While my predecessors and I have been calling for the referral to the International Criminal Court and the establishment of a mechanism by the General Assembly, it is relevant to consider that universal jurisdiction has been more clearly defined and expanded which offers opportunities for criminal accountability for the DPRK. Also, there have been civil lawsuit efforts led by victims and lawyers and non-judicial accountability movements, such as keeping records and memorializations are emerging. Both are important advances regarding accountability, 
not foreseen in the landmark report. Regarding state cooperation, in the last 10 years, we have made some progress on engaging with the DPRK through the UN human rights mechanisms, including an official visit to the DPRK made by the former Special Rapporteur on Rights of the Persons with Disability. However, the international community has failed to reach consensus on what can be done to improve the situation of human rights in the DPRK. This issue should be prioritized. Moreover, there have been setbacks regarding efforts to engage with the DPRK and gather first-hand information of the human rights situation. Since January 2020, the UN country team and most of the diplomats have left the DPRK due to COVID-19 related border restrictions. And the number of SKPs arriving in the Republic of Korea has decreased drastically. During this time, our engagement and access to information have been the worst ever since the beginning of this mandate. This is a very concerning situation. We don't know what exactly is happening to the people in the DPRK and to the North Korean escapees who may be stuck in China. As a mandate holder, I am taking a two-track approach pursuing both engagement and accountability, but the current situation does not help either track. The effect of the pandemic-related restrictive measures have also been detrimental to the warranty and enjoyment of human rights in the DPRK. The specific areas, among many others, are critical in this regard, violations of the right to food and arbitrary arrest and detention. The international community's attention should be focused on them to assess the situation and seek or create the best and swiftest way to provide relief. As it has been mentioned, the current situation is very different to what it was 10 years ago when the COI was established. We have faced unforeseen challenges and setbacks, but we have also witnessed important advances in certain areas. On the year that marks the 10th anniversary of the creation of the Commission of Inquiry on the Human Rights in the DPRK, I see this as timely occasion to take stock of the achievements and shortcomings of the United Nations and member states in their engagement on human rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. As you may know, I have identified women and girls as the first priority of my work, based on the international obligations of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and as a situation that requires urgent attention according to the information gathered by the previous mandate holders and civil society organizations. While focusing on the human rights of women and girls has revealed some progress, some human rights violations have remained unmitigated or have even gone worse. In the conference on the human rights women and girls in the DPRK held in Seoul in January, some of the key issues raised were women in detention, women crossing the border, violence against women and impunity, poor women's sexual and reproductive health, and women in Jiang Madan. These are some of the topics my mandate will focus on in the time to come. At the same time, I will further look into the role of women in peace and security both at the national and international levels, because the voices of North Korean SKP's women at the conference made it clear to me that women are already playing a transformative role in the North Korean society and are key to stability and peace. Moreover, I am planning to further review the implementation of the recommendations made by the COI later this year and next year and address grave human rights violations including within the detention system and a wide range of accountability efforts. At the same time, I will continue to highlight the dire situation that people may be facing in the DPRK and the urgent need for the international community to engage with the DPRK on human rights issues, despite the heightened security tension. It might be unnecessary to state that the work done by the COI 10 years ago 
is a mainstay for the challenging endeavors that this mandate envisions to address in the immediate future. Thank you. Um, I was moderating up the big child does not need an introduction. Most of us remember that he's a senior chair. He's uh, a professor of government and holds uh, the DSM here chair in the Department of Government and the School of Foreign Service. Of course, he was director of Asian Affairs at the National Security Council, responsible for Japan. Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Island nations. The course he was the deputy head of delegation to the United States. It's all he got to sit on, um, I guess, seven editorial boards, as author of five books. He's a person, a number of op eds, articles, uh, and uh, other publications. So, Victor, I had to do this just to moderate this. Here we go. It's uh, all yours. Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to moderate. My job is only to moderate this very distinguished uh, um, panel with Ambassador Bob Joseph and Ambassador Joe DeTrani. Um, uh, Ambassador DeTrani um, and I have spent many years working together uh, when we were working on party talks with regard to North Korea. Ambassador DeTrani was formerly president of the Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security, and prior to that, president of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. Uh, long, distinguished career, both as a diplomat and then also uh, in, in the intelligence community. Uh, and then, of course, Ambassador Bob Joseph, senior scholar at the National Institute for Public Policy and a member of the board of directors of uh, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. He was Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, and uh, I also um, had the, pl pr the, the pleasure of working with him and learning from his many, many years of experience in, in government. So it's really an honor to be able to have a conversation with these two folks uh, today. Um, the topic of discussion, of course, is North Korean human rights. And in particular, I think the reason the organizers put this particular panel together is that here we have two members of a very important report uh, that has been written under the auspices of the National Institute for Public Policy, Public Policy, National Institute for Public Policy. For Public Policy. Um, um, we had Bob Joseph um, join us in CSIS for a, for a live podcast on this. and. Uh, I see you have the, the, the paper in front of you. The title of it is, is it's called it's a, a Paradigm Shift, A Human Rights Upfront Approach to North Korean Policy. That's the title of the panel. Um, and I thought to sort of get us started, uh, I'd ask uh, Ambassador Joseph to you know, give us some of the basic points that are in the policy. I read it and um, discussed it with him and uh, with Greg. And, you know, I think it is, I mean, it, the title is appropriate. It really is advocating for a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about not just the human rights, but the national security problem uh, that we have with North Korea uh, in, in the face of decades of failed efforts under one particular paradigm, which I'm sure Bob's going to speak to. So, uh, so with that, I thought we'd start with uh, Bob to give us some opening remarks, and then we'll go to Ambassador Dishani for uh, comments and then we'll open it up to a discussion. So, Bob, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Victor. It's a pleasure to be here and it's great to see you again. We make a number of points about your study and the report. First, I would emphasize that this was a collaborative effort. Greg mentioned the other members of the strategy group. David Maxwell was there. Joe, of course, was, was part of the group. Uh, Nick Everstaff, who I think will be here later, later today, Bob Collins, uh, Olivia Enos. Uh, it, was a, it was a really interesting group. It was a group that brought much different perspectives and different backgrounds to the same challenge that we faced with regard to the North Korea. And I come from a non proliferation and arms control background. Uh, others came from a human rights background. Uh, we found a great deal of common ground 
uh, both in terms of findings as well as the recommendations and the design and hopefully the implementation of the, uh, of the strategy. That's point one. Point two, and, and I mentioned this in my opening remarks this morning, the basic premise of the study of the report is that U.S. policy uh, in particular has failed for three decades going back to the uh, administration. There's been remarkable consistency in that policy. There's been differences with regard to the carrots, the sticks that we should offer in North Korea. But for the most part, each successive administration placed at the center of its policy and as the highest priority, the denuclearization of North Korea, attempting to convince the Kim regime to abandon their nuclear weapons program. The uh, failure of that effort, I think, is best seen in the growth of North Korea's nuclear weapons stockpile because for 30 years they have been pursuing nuclear weapons. A number of years ago, they were assessed to have just one or two nuclear weapons. Today, it's 40 to 60 in terms of the assessment. There's a recent grand projection that. By 2027, which is only four years from now, and they sound like a long time for some of the younger members of our audience. But for us, you know, who've been around a while, it's a blink of an eye. So by 2027, North Korea could possess over 200 nuclear weapons. And we know they're ambitiously, aggressively pursuing the ballistic and hypersonic missile capabilities to deliver those weapons. So if you need sort of a metric of success, or in this case, a metric of failure, just look at exhibit A, and that is the growth in their nuclear weapons uh, arsenal. Uh, as our report, report uh, points out, uh, arms control for the US, I mean, this, this negotiation for denuclearization has really substituted for a strategy. It's an objective, but it is substituted for a strategy. Whereas the North, when it has entered uh, into negotiations and when it has made agreements uh, out of those negotiations, it saw that you know that process of the means of buying time, buying time to expand, expand their arsenal. And so we concluded uh, that uh, there is no combination of sticks and carrots that's going to uh, have the end result of North Korea abandoning its nuclear weapons program. We have to look elsewhere for that. And we looked at uh, parallels uh, with the Soviet Union. We looked at other strategies uh, for dealing with very challenging, very difficult uh, uh, threats. Uh, and we came to the position that what we really required was a comprehensive approach, an approach that built on sort of all of the tools of statecraft that we have. Diplomacy is very, very important. It's important for alliance management. It's important uh, in, in our case because we're putting human rights up front to uh, to, you know, to to get more support, whether it's from the European Union and Commission or from you know or from other sectors uh, of the of the international community. Uh, economic tools are very important. You think about economic tools, you think about some of the financial techniques that we have and levers that we have. Uh, it's a very powerful, it's a very powerful set of uh, set of uh, instruments. Here I would just refer you to maybe see my ancient history again to some of you, but to the Bank of Delta Asia uh, episode, uh, which had a profound effect, uh, I think, on, uh, on North Korean thinking. Uh, about uh, about the challenges from their perspective that uh, that they face. Uh, deterrence and defense, very important. We were discussing earlier at the at the, at the table uh, the the efforts uh, of the U.S. and South Korea uh, to improve, to strengthen extended deterrence. And the joint meeting in uh, Kings Bay, uh, Georgia which is one of the home ports for our FFBMs, for our submarine ballistic missile force. Uh, and that's important. And the first panel today, I talked about some of the, the human rights approaches to, to, to North Korea, some of the advancements that have been made, the efforts that have been undertaken, 
So, you know, each each of these sort of areas of each of these instruments can provide certain benefits. But as I said in my opening remarks, we've treated these as, as independent silos. Uh, as one uh, colleague of mine uh, referred to them as centers of, or, or as, uh, uh, as, as you know, centers of, 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 of excellence. Uh, but they don't, they, there's no cross cutting of capability, there's no cross cutting. Uh, uh, effort uh, to bring them together in a unified strategy. And so we have, for the most part, made significant progress in a number of different areas. And I applaud that, whether it's human rights, or defense, or insurance, or the economic, but we haven't applied them in a comprehensive and integrated, and integrated fashion. Uh, third point, uh, and it's the obvious one if we continue to do what we have been doing, uh, we can expect more failure, and we can expect an even greater threat from now. Imagine having this conversation five years from now, if we haven't changed policy, with North Korea possessing more nuclear weapons than Great Britain or or France. How is that? How is that going to sort of affect the non-proliferation regime? Because we know North Korea sells whatever it has. Uh, if uh, you know if. if if it has a buyer who has the you know the cash uh, to purchase uh, the goods, and so thinking about North Korea selling nuclear weapons to other rogue states or even to terrorist entities is certainly not something that we can that, that, that we can discount. In fact, I think we have to be we have to be prepared for it. And I know every president will say, "Well, we'll have a red line. We'll have a red line, and if there's any selling nuclear weapons to." or other rogue states or to terrorists, uh, we will stop it. Well, I'm a veteran of a number of presidents, two presidents, I shouldn't overstate it, two presidents who drew red lines. And in each case, North Korea crossed the red line. And in both cases, we backed down. So I'm a real skeptic when it comes to, when it comes to uh, the rhetoric of, uh, of red lines. Fourth, we need a paradigm shift. And we need to, first of all, think differently about North Korea and the challenge from North Korea. Because thinking differently will drive, I think, us to a different, a different policy. But it's very difficult, particularly for bureaucracies, to think differently. Uh, some would say to think at all. But to think, you know, differently about about a challenge, and we anticipate that there will be a great deal of resistance, bureaucratic resistance, uh, from the State Department, and I would think from the intelligence community and from other interagency partners uh, to what we're proposing, because it's different, because it casts doubt on the conventional wisdom. But the conventional wisdom in, in this case is that you know, even though we've seen the movie you know, 50 times, uh, the next time we watch it, it's going to have a different ending. Our policy will achieve a different ending. The same policy will achieve a different ending. Uh, and in that context, let me just point out that our report mentions six strategic propositions that underlie our, our, our findings. Uh, the first is that, you know, as long as the Kim regime uh, is in, you know, remains in power, the North will never give up its nuclear weapons. I think it's very clear. So think about that. What are the implications of that? Uh, clearly, uh, the requirement for a new approach uh, is, uh, is evident. We've been criticized by some by saying, well, that means that this is regime change. Well, it does mean that it's regime change. But it's not regime change Iraq style. And we make very clear in one of our other strategic propositions that this is not about the US and its allies using force to achieve this, this objective. It's about providing through a human rights upfront approach the information uh, to the North Korean people. And Greg, I, I think, is very articulate when he talks about the three stories. Uh, that we need to that we need to tell, 
uh, the story about the dismal human rights conditions in North Korea. This is to the North Korean people. The story about the corruption of the Kim regime and the story about the truth of the outside world, in particular South Korea, and what a free, democratic, prosperous country has to offer in terms of human rights and just the basic dignity of the people of North Korea. And we think it's through this internal change that you will get an end to the Kim regime. And I think it's important to think back about, again, ancient history to many people here, but think about the containment policy of the Soviet Union. That's what this was about. I mean, we'd go back to George Cannon and the long telegram uh, or, or, the, or the Mr. X article. And he talks about containment in a very sort of strategic way. Is the Soviet Union going to change? No, it's not going to change. It's not going to change. It has to, it has to change from, from within. Okay. And, it was, and, and, that was, and that was sort of a strategic uh, uh, principle that guided American foreign policy for decades during the Cold War. Yes, again, there were differences in how each administration applied it, but the basic thought was containment. And that lasted through the Reagan administration. And it was, you know, and it was, uh, I would argue, a very successful policy. What did it require? It required patience. It required strength. And it required leadership. Leadership domestically and leadership at the international level. And that's the role that the United States played. And I think that's very similar to what the United States uh, did play with regard to North Korea. Uh, there's no easy solution to the challenge. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the threat uh, exists by many different levels. We have to be prepared to deter that threat, to defend against that threat, uh, to uh, uh, act you know, with, with other tools of statecraft. When we think about North Korean uh, proliferation activities, we think about the proliferation security initiative and the, uh, you know, the, the many tools that, uh, that we have. Uh, other other propositions, uh, and this is one that I think really stands out in our paper, is that the greatest vulnerability of the Kim regime is from within. And that's consistent with my comments about promoting human rights, having a human rights uh, upfront, upfront approach. Uh, the third, the U.S. strategy must be based on active campaign, including prevention of proliferation, as well as effective deterrence. There's some things that we're doing today, but again, we have to do it in an integrated way. We have to allow ourselves, or we have to uh, ensure that the benefits of each of these tools is applied in a comprehensive and integrated way. Uh, fourth is, uh, is just that U.S. strategy for countering North Korea uh, requires the integration of all tools. Uh, the fifth, the preemptive use of military force by the United States and South Korea uh, is not, you know, should only be considered if there is high level confidence that the North is about to attack, particularly with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and and uh, sixth, uh, you know, is, is a recognition of the resistance that we're going to find with Russia and China in particular. Of course they will. Uh, they, they will resist this because of their own dismal human rights uh, records, uh, but also because they find common cause in many respects uh, with North Korea, just think of North Korea uh, providing legal uh, assistance to Russia in Russia's campaign against uh, Ukraine uh, and the crimes, in my view, are against humanity that are occurring in that context as well. Uh, so those those are the strategic propositions. Our report also deals with past myths that we believe have colored U.S. policy and have, in some cases, uh, dominated U.S. policy. Perhaps the most powerful and pernicious myth is that if we bring human rights to the forefront, the North won't negotiate with us. They won't like this. Well, yes, it's true that they won't like it, uh, but we've never done that. We've always, I should say always, most times in the past, what we've done, and you saw this in the previous administration, was raise human rights. And President Trump did that, particularly notable was at the State of the Union address. But then when he got into his negotiating mode, not, not a word about human rights. And that is that, that that's a pattern that you can that you can discern, I think, in previous administrations as well. 
including the one that, that I served uh, as, uh, as under at uh, the State Department. Uh, but we deal with we deal with these myths. Uh, one final comment on two things that we that we are that we are not proposing. We are not proposing an end to diplomacy. This is a criticism of the thing. Oh, you just want you just want an end to diplomacy. Well, no. I mean, if the North Koreans are willing to negotiate in good faith, well, think, think of that for a minute. But if they are, uh, then we're willing to you know we're willing to to negotiate. But that's not going to be at the center of our policy. What's going to be in the center of our policy is human rights, combining all of these other instruments into that comprehensive, cohesive, uh, cohesive strategy. And second, uh, as I mentioned, this is not about the use of force to achieve regime change. This is a much more patient, much more longer term effort uh, in which we bring enlightenment through education uh, and through whatever techniques we can uh, to the North Korean people. Uh, about their abysmal human rights uh, uh, situation, about the outside world, about the corruption, as I mentioned, of, uh, of the Kim regime. Uh, so it's it's important that we note, I think, what this is not about, because that's usually the criticism uh, that accompanies uh, any any uh, challenge to uh, conventional wisdom. Let me stop there. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bob. Terrific. Uh, terrific lay down of the report. Uh, let's now go to Ambassador Trani. Joel, if you could offer your thoughts. Yeah, very, 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 thank you, Victor. Thank you for outstanding comments. And, uh, thank you, Greg. Hey, I'm doing some great work here. Such an important issue. Uh, I can't say enough about it. You all applaud what you're doing. Thank you. you and your comments. Look, let me just say, uh, I'm, I'm going to be very brief on this. You heard from uh, Ambassador Joseph. Uh, we really couldn't pen on this, and we, we all, this is a collegial group here, and we all work with uh, Ambassador Joseph. But we couldn't pen on this, and uh, we can go down the mark, and we heard from him. Uh, and you have it in front of you what we're talking about here. And what we're talking about here is so important. This is something that Victor and I work with in the Six Body Talks. Victor and I, colleagues in the Six Body Talks, because we didn't have. Official talking points saying, okay, uh, okay, we want to all all activities at the nuclear facility, and then we want this. And what we didn't have was the peace sign, but we want you to uh, close that gulag and uh, that put in the camp. And we want to have a team to go in to, uh, to inspect it, and we want some transparency. We did that, Victor and I, and our, our colleagues did that. Now, bilateral talks with the, uh, with the North Korean. And just think, you know, you gun, who was the deputy there, and that's the gun. We were hearing some of this when we said, you know, if you want to negotiate, what North Koreans want, wanted, and wants is normal relations with the United States. It should keep us foremost in our minds. They want normal relations with the United States, but on their terms, as the nuclear weapons say. So we know that. We know that. So we made it very clear, even when we had the joint statement in September 19, 2005. Okay, this is this gets us into the ballpark. Now we can talk about a process to normalize, but to normalize particularly for the US is more than just people put in nation. Because many of the North Koreans on their side thought it was once we get to the denuclearization piece down, we we can move towards normalization. And you know, obviously you should say you know immediate embassy is not expected to happen. It was another one of my mouth. We put him on an embassy. We're talking about human rights. We would want transparency. We would want to see progress on that and so on. And 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 then what Victor and I heard uh, and, uh, in a private conversation, this was at the table with everybody. It was just a bilateral issue, normalization with the United States. So it would be the same bilateral issue with the ROK, with Japan, et cetera. But we heard, and I'll I cite the name, I'm not using it, right? Or anything about the United States, right? It's very, very effective diplomat. Uh, he said, well, you know, Mr. Trump, he said, we'll never get to normalization. We're talking about, I'm not saying 100%, we're talking about incremental progress and stuff. So that, that, that sort of was sort of a wake up call, but nonetheless, this is an issue, it's a moral issue, it's an imperative in the UN. 
came out with a report about a year and a half ago. What the equivalent is in our pain about the 20% of this population is not ours. It's a stark. And we do know, we do know from the effectiveness. We, uh, we you know, I just did this book review on the hard road out of one woman's escape from North Korea by Ji Yun Park, uh, where she talked about uh, growing up in North Korea. It was life, and, and then finding uh, a way to using traffickers to, to China and then getting repatriated. But that spike, when you sit down with these people, you say, How could that be? I mean, that'd be foremost in our lives. It's a country that has these values. That's who we are as people. So, but I agree with the Ambassador Joseph Silver. I completely agree with him on the point. This is a whole of government approach to all the issues. And we're not saying don't go back to talk. We're saying change, <laughs> change from within, change and do something about this issue. As we're saying about denuclearization, and and on the other side would be uh, the sanctions, etc., and then we went towards normalization of relations. What we're saying on that is part of that process to normalize, change from within, and be concerned about your own people. And I think many of us, I'm one of them, in uh, December of 2011, thought that Kim Jong un coming into power. This is a young man, 27, schooled in Switzerland. Coming in, this would be uh, a fresh approach. This would be the prospects were high that there would be movement in this direction. At least I had that view. I think many others did also. Uh, but obviously, I think that didn't happen. And it's not happening. I mean, we saw some of the stark images of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, some of uh, the people in this other administration, uh, his own bad brother, uh, being executed. Uh, but but the gulags were there, and, and the prison camps were there, and someone uh, was, was still there. You are born into a, a caste system, and you're, you know, you're condemned to that for the rest of your life. It's not who we are. So, so by putting human rights in the fore, and part of that is not just the rhetoric of saying putting human rights in the fore, it's doing something about it. And Ambassador Joseph mentioned uh, during the, uh, the Reagan administration, information and the power of information. Many of you in the room here are journalists. You know the power of information. And that was the concern of, of, of the Soviet, the leadership of the Soviet Union before Russia, was denying the Soviet people information, the truthful information. We're not talking about what we're seeing today, what we're seeing during recent elections, et cetera, this information, using the, the, uh, the social media, et cetera, to, to uh, store information, to feed this information, to exploit the people. But we're talking about truthful information, what's happening in the world, what's happening in your own, what's happening in your own country, Soviet Union. Right? You heard him mention that what's happening in your own country, getting at it to talk about. So the most frequent people need to see that, what's happening in our country, what's happening certainly in the Republic of Korea, but what's happening in the world, and and and, and understand that. And then hopefully that would have an impact on the leadership now. Maybe not being hopefully. Uh, naive, and I, I think I am by going down a path like that. I can say to them, I'm hopeful that with this focus on human rights, getting information into North Korea, making it a, a part of our, our strategic approach to negotiations with North Korea, for the implement the goal of, you know, eventually the reunification of the criminal defense. Reunification, but also uh, uh, values we all hold, the Republic of Korea and the United States, as we and others, values we hold as freedoms we, we, we cherish. You would say that has to be that has to be the, the unified Korean Peninsula. So, and, and, and we think information is a great part of that, and, and emphasizing this. So, I on the one on this, I think the strategy itself. It's a strategy, it's a path, it's a vision. And it could be implemented, uh, obviously, by the leaders in the United States, and the Korea, Japan, and Sarah. 
and, and hopefully China and uh, would, would be supportive of, of moving on something like that, but that's, that's something else. Because this is really an issue mainly for the ROK family in the United States. And this is how we were in the six party talks. Let's be very candid about that. That's where we were on that. And, and, and uh, I think we have to start doing something. We have to start moving in that direction. And I'll end on this note. I know that there was a lot of controversy with the Mujahideen government on the balloons that were going into, into Gulf Korea and the concern that they were shot down. And, Sort of blue just a few weeks ago. Yeah. It was concerned about that being shut down. So I think we got a sense of all that. Uh, but the fact is, uh, we're talking about getting information and going for truthful information, not disinformation, not telling people to rise up and overthrow the government. We're saying you should be aware of what you're going to do. And hopefully, the elites in the Alabama people are aware of it. They have access to this. If they don't, this would be available to them. And it would be hard if we never sit down and we can all come together negotiate. This would be front and center human rights. Human rights, in addition to being verified. So we uh, will not see Joseph and uh, Greg and uh, you know, uh, HR and Kay and all of you uh, being so supportive of that. I thank you. And for Victor, thank you for all the work you're doing on this issue. I appreciate that. We all appreciate it. Uh, uh... Thanks, uh, both uh, Ambassador Trip to Trani, Ambassador Johnson. Um, really interesting conversation. Let me, uh, uh, before we go to the floor, let me just ask a couple of questions. The first is um, uh, in terms of the, the so called paradigm shift. And we've had conversations about this. I mean, as you mentioned, there is sort of this standing conventional wisdom deeply embedded in the US uh, bureaucracy that. Uh, denuclearization is uh, it's about diplomacy, and whenever we're at the table with North Korea, that takes priority over everything else, including including human rights. And so, um, and so, there's this view that when when we are negotiating with them, we don't talk about human rights. When we're not negotiating with them, yeah, maybe we could talk about human rights, but it's really tactical. It's not part of the strategy that you're talking about. So, how do you change that? Right? How do you change that way of thinking? And I'm wondering, like, to what extent you all have drawn any lessons from arguably the paradigm shift that has happened in the U.S. government on China policy, right? We, for decades, had gone with the sort of responsible stakeholder template for China, you know, going back to Nixon. And, and now we're in a completely different place in terms of China. The U.S. government is completely, I would say completely, but it's organized differently around this problem. So... So that would be the first question like, uh, on, on trend action. Um, well, why don't we take that one? Why don't we take that one first? Yeah, I'll take the first question and I'll leave the more difficult China question to, to John. Uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of this notion that denuclearization is not through negotiation, I, I don't know of any case in which. That was actually that actually occurred with other political states. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to lead the negotiations with Libya, and I say it was a true opportunity because those negotiations were done out of the White House in secret, without even the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State knowing about those negotiations. And in those negotiations, I can tell you that we had every advantage. We had we had cracked the AQCon network, which was the lifeline to their program. We had caught the Libyans in a lie. We had just gone in to Iraq, and things were going really well in terms of the defeating of the Iraqi army. Mean, just think of think of Gaddafi's mindset. And oh, by the way, three days before we meet with the Libyans, we pull Saddam out of the spider hole, and, and the images are all over the international, uh, everywhere you look in the international media. We had we had everything to achieve what we wanted. That's not going to be the case with North Korea. All of these challenges are different. All of them are unique in different ways. 
but we did achieve denuclearization through negotiation with liberty. But as I said, we had everything going for us. The stars were in total alignment. Uh, and even I, you know, could, could achieve the outcome that we achieved, which was to send a large ship over to load it with hundreds of metric tons of their nuclear equipment, as well as their longer range missiles and bring it back to the United States. Now that's denuclearization. Okay. I would not expect that with North Korea for any number of reasons. And I wouldn't expect it with Iran, and I wouldn't expect it with other proliferant states. Again, yeah, each, each is unique. In terms of sort of this notion that if only we wait, if only we're patient, and there will be reform, there will be some type of reform, whether it's 2011 with this young man coming in uh, to take up the reins. Uh, I, I just keep thinking about the intelligence reports that I used to see much earlier in terms of the turnover of Soviet leaders. Oh, Brezhnev. Brezhnev likes jazz. I think we could do business with him. Mm -hmm. Or Andropa. Well, he, now he likes scotch, so maybe we can do business with him. I mean, if there ever was sort of a, you know, a, a wishful thinking, I mean, that's, that's what it is. I don't think the North Korean regime is able to reform. Okay, maybe the daughter, the young daughter will come in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, maybe she'll be different. We can't wait. As I said, we don't have that time. We don't have the luxury of that time. We need, we need to have a different strategy. We need to have it now. As Joe says, we need action. Otherwise, we're going to face a much more dangerous world uh, and not one that's going to be any easier for us. It's only going to be much, much more difficult as well as more dangerous. No, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with the comments about that. Uh, but on China, Victor, it's a great question. Uh, for China to be a responsible stakeholder right now is <laughs> they need to, there needs to be a paradigm shift with certainly with North Korea. They need to they need to use that leverage they have with North Korea, you know, over 90% of the oil and petroleum products, et cetera, come from China. I mean, they just they have cut off the spigot and uh, the economy will just crumble. So China has all the leverage we want to get them back to negotiations, have them stop with this uh, with launching one of these ICBMs and shoveling launch Pacific missiles and hypersonics and so forth. You, you could do that, Beijing, you can do that, Xi Jinping, and so that would be responsible. We just saw their peace proposal for, for Ukraine. Uh, hold it, no, no question about it. Uh, and, and, Kind of looks like their denuclearization also <laughs> so, similar to you know, a lot of words on that one. Um, when you talk about sanctions, uh, we have it should be the UN, we should just look at the station no longer. That's not something that we should be in other states or states that have uh, pursued a general nonsense. If that were the case, uh, we see with the U.S. security Council going on now because of uh, on, on North Korea. Despite the ICBM launches, et cetera, the Security Council, there are no resolutions and no sanction as required by past sanctions that were, resolutions that were passed. So, so on China to be a responsible stakeholder, just the, the terminology we're using here, do it. Just do it. Uh, and, and, and would North Korea do it on that way? Look, on uh, with the South China Sea, with Hong Kong national security law, with the Uyghurs uh, in, in Xinjiang, we done a whole list of things. And what we see recently in on Taiwan, there's so much out there uh, that that tells us that tells us, look, uh, uh, China, uh, come back to a, a dialogue. I mean, pick up the phone if someone's calling and wants to know why you have a balloon over the United States. Pick up the phone, or maybe you should have told it before he even asked you about that. We have a long ways to go on China, Victor. Uh, and we have, uh, and I think you're right, though. I mean, we've gone from a, uh, my, we're the ones, I mean, it was China looked to the United States, and with Deng Xiaoping, I looked to the United States to, to get China back on the path as one of the poorest countries in East Asia in 1978. Be the second largest uh, largest economy in the world now today. It was the United States, the World Trade Organization, 2001. It's the United States. So, so in many ways, um, 
kind of does all of that through the United States. Uh, but I think the most disquieting thing there is that we uh, we, we see issues, especially United States, especially Bob, because Victor and I and you, we Victor and I on the, on the field in the negotiations worked with uh, Wang Yi and we worked with the Chinese and China hosts the six party talks. And China was intimate with the, the September 19th United States uh, that, that sort of halted things that really fell apart in 2009. But again, where's that leadership from China? Which we're just not seeing it. We're not seeing it when Xi Jinping, as you saw from Young's, certainly Young's got pain, Young's is going to keep it out. She, she, can I just yeah, follow please. up uh, Joe's comments exactly, exactly on the mark? The only time that I witnessed when I was in government, China willing to help in a meaningful way, forget the words, in a meaningful way, to take action with regard to North Korea's nuclear program was after the first nuclear test in October of 2006. This was a shock. And Victor, you remember, I think we you were on together. We went together. We, yeah. went, we yeah. went together. Yeah. You know, Connie decided, Dr. Rice decided to go to the to go to the region within a couple of days of the test because there was a whole lot of concern that if she didn't, and if she didn't reaffirm our nuclear guarantee to our allies, that may mean a lot of different things, none of them good. Uh, for non-proliferation and for, for U.S. policy. So she goes, we stop, and I think it was Tokyo was the first stop. She she makes some very firm statements about the credibility of our, of our nuclear guarantee. Interestingly, well, I think this, the sole stop was a... Well, I, that, that's one for the history books. But the next, you know, the, the stop after that was Beijing. And the first thing the Chinese did was to thank us for reaffirming our security guarantee, our nuclear guarantee to Japan. Okay, just think about that for a moment, and I think it would be obvious why they why they did that. They didn't want Japan going into it. Okay. But it was interesting that at that time, in October of 2006, the Chinese support, and you mentioned sanctions earlier today in the first panel, that's when those sanctions come into being. Okay. And that took that took the you know unanimous well the the five uh, permanent members had to agree to that, and both Russia and China agreed. Our, our, our interests intersected at that time. And I think the Chinese felt disrespected because they had told the North Koreans not to test. There's a whole lot of backstory to this. But it was the time when we had an opportunity, I thought. Okay, I thought we had an opportunity to fundamentally change the direction of our policy and to achieve the goal of denuclearization and only held firm. Okay. Because the Chinese we've been on our side more than just hosting and chairing the six party talks, okay, which is something they did, I thought, to escape any, any real responsibility for the outcome. And they kept pushing us to bilateral discussions. That's my recollection, where you know much more about it than, than I do, but that's how I would call it. But it was it was a window of opportunity. And guess who closed that window of opportunity, in, in my view? The United States, the Bush administration, my administration. I have been working very hard on defensive measures. Remember the defensive measures that we're putting into place? And for whatever reason, in early 2007, the decision is made at the level of the president that we're going to go for negotiations. And we know the result. But the opportunity was lost, the strategic opportunity to work with China at that time. I don't think we're going to have that opportunity, at least in the near future or in the midterm future, because it's a different China than it was in 2006. It's a much different China. Uh, and uh, even though they have uh, a lot of uh, leverage over, over North Korea and provide some vital uh, lifeline uh, uh, capabilities to North Korea, uh, I don't think we're going to have that opportunity again. We have to do it on our own. We have to do it with our leadership. And in terms of overcoming the bureaucracy, the, the internal bureaucracy, the inevitable interagency resistance that's going to come from this, and I think it is not just a, but the intel community and probably every other member of the sort of national security community of the interagency, 
we're going to have to have a president who comes into office, a new president, because the Biden administration isn't going to change, a new president who comes into office, and Trump wouldn't change either. We'll get going on that one. But uh, you know, a new administration with a new president who comes in making this a priority and appointing the right people to get the job done to overcome the resistance of the bureaucracy. That's a tall order. It's a long shot. But I think it's the best opportunity that we have to change the future, to shape the future. Great. Um, so presumably the, the purpose of these sort of guys is your road testing the strategy. So let me ask another uh, another question in that regard, and that is, um, so as you said, like the uh, ultimate um, result of this strategy would be the end of the regime, right? The end of the Kim regime. Then what? Like then what comes after that? Um, how do we think about, you know, a post Kim Jong-un regime from a human rights perspective, from a non-proliferating perspective? Uh, and how do we think of that? I mean, the presumption I, I have from the strategy is that anything's better than what we have now, right? Both on the proliferation side and on the human rights side. But have you, has your group thought about uh, what, you know, what if you're successful? <laughs> be careful what you ask for. Right, be careful what you ask for. You go first, well, then I'll follow. Uh, well, we have thought about it. Uh, and we do advocate uh, in the in the report uh, the unification because ultimately we see the future uh, of Korea as a unified, prosperous, democratic uh, entity, uh, and uh, that is uh, something that we need to work toward. Uh, it's not something that happens magically or overnight uh, with the with the wave of a of a magic wand. Uh, it is something that has to be determined. There has to be, I think, a, a glide path to that to that uh, outcome. Uh, and I would advocate that if we get to that, if we get to that point where we're looking at the end of the regime, that we have sort of this 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 pathway put forward with milestones. Uh, and again, to you know, to try to uh, uh, make it as soft of its transition as we can. Uh, but the, the future, in our view, is that a unified, prosperous, and democratic Korea uh, is the answer. So, so I would go along with the totally, that uh, Bob said, on the reunification, reunification, reunification of the Korean Peninsula. There's, there's no question about it. But what I would focus on change from within. That's, that's what we're talking about. Change from within. We're getting information into North Korea, and we're getting information that, and, and we saw that change in the, uh, the former Soviet Union during the Reagan administration. Uh, you know, the last time by the Stryker, et cetera. And regardless of where that went, there was there was that realization where the leadership itself said, uh, and, the, and the person who brought the this instant here, we need to change. We need to. We need to. We, we're a pariah state where, you know, they just defeated in Afghanistan, et cetera. When you look at North Korea, they are a pariah state. They're, they're, they are isolated out there. And, and very, you know, they're the, uh, headed to uh, the survival uh, to, to, to China. And I don't think that's where they probably want to be. That's why they were looking to the U.S. and they still do. It's for normal relations. So they don't have to be there relying on China. So they can change from within. Change from within in regards to human rights, these gulags and, and the, the some going and, and, and putting people in these camps and, and so forth, denuclearization, reun the reunification with the South, the values and, and what have you. It's a different administration, so we had to change from within. Um, you know, I uh, sort of thinking about the strategy and like how you. Uh, uh, sell this to a future administration, I think, and may perhaps you already do this in the report, but, um, um, you know, it's, it's the, strat the strategy that emerges here in, in part emerges from the failure of every other instrument that we've used over the last three decades in and of itself. So whether that's diplomacy, whether that's carrots, whether that sticks, you know, in just in terms of just sanctions, I mean, the COVID lockdown in North Korea shows that sanctions alone don't work. I mean, 
North Korea's sanctioned itself harder than any sanctions that Bob Joseph and John Bolton could have come up with, right? And they're, and they're still there, right? Um, um, maybe there are other ones that you didn't tell us about, but, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, uh, summit diplomacy didn't work, right? I mean, there's a long list of things that we've tried uh, and, and, and none of these things have worked. And so what are we left with? We're left with this, right? This is something that we haven't, you know, we haven't tried yet. So that, that's part of it. The second thing on unification, I think, and this is just some work we've done in CSIS, not interviewing defectors, but interviewing uh, North Koreans along the border. Greg's familiar with some of the work that we've done, is that um, uh, it's a small sample size, but the North Korean public's view of unification is actually quite positive. Uh, that they actually, they identify ethnically with regard to unification. It's not so much economic, it's ethnic identification, and arguably they're more in favor of it than the average South Korean. So um, uh, so that's just a little tidbit of data, but uh, I'd love your response on that, not, not so much on the second point, but on the first point about, you know, this long list of things that we've tried that has not been successful. Well, we have tried a lot of things. I would differ a little bit, Victor. I don't know if I don't sound too sort of academic on this, in my teaching words, including in the Fletcher School. <laughs> uh, I think the I, I think you have to look at failure differently. It's not the failure of each individual instrument, because I think we have made significant progress. In, in, in using sanctions, in using the financial tools, like I mentioned, BDA, uh, that, that, that was that was a, an effective use of the tool. We've made progress in defense, in our joint defense. We, we're making, I think, more progress on the extended deterrence side. So each of these sort of cylinders of excellence, again, are, are producing something of value. The problem is we've never had a strategy for bringing them together. Arms control negotiations or denuclearization is substituted for a strategy. I mean, it masquerades itself as a strategy, but it's not. It's, it's an objective. It, it's my objective, it's your objective, but it's not a strategy. The strategy is bringing all of this, all of these tools together, including, and I think upfront and probably critical to success is the human rights effort, like you mentioned earlier, the information, the influence campaigns that we talked about in, in, in our report. That's, that's what's gonna get that internal change. But all of that is in the context of these other instruments being used as well. Uh, it's, not, it's not an easy thing for, as, as you know, Victor, and, and, and Joe, you know, it's not easy for governments to come up with strategies. Okay, I mean, there's just too many. There's just too many, too many divisions. And even when we do come up with a strategy, you remember the North Korea strategy that was approved in 2004 by the principals and by the president, called tailored containment. It wasn't implemented. My view, the State Department just didn't implement it. Why? Because they went down the negotiation path. I'll just leave it at that, Joe. Well, I think I'm going to leave it at that also. <laughs> Okay, well, we have uh, here in the audience a very knowledgeable group, so why don't we open up to get any uh, thoughts or uh, recommendations that people have with regard to the, this report, uh, including other members. I know like David's here as well, uh, if he'd like to make some comments about, about the work on the report as well, so. David, do you want to say anything about the report? Uh, well, I'm telling you to talk about unification in the next panel. Yeah, look, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. The Koreans have to have to cause unification. We can't we can't do it for them. Uh, and so I think it's our interest to help Korea uh, to achieve unification. Um, you know, I, I see there are four paths to unification. Uh, the first one is peaceful. And I think that the peaceful plan is most complex. Uh, and it should be the focus of the Ministry of Unification, the plan for peaceful unification. And I say it's most complex and difficult, not because Kim Jong un is you know, not going to go quietly into the night, it's because it takes the integration of two economic systems, two political systems, two militaries, you know, two divergent cultures somewhat. Uh, and so the plan for peaceful unification uh, is the right thing to do. It's done from the moral high ground. 
But most importantly, everything that is done for peaceful planning and unification will have application in every other path. And I said there's four paths. So number one is peaceful. Number two is war. And we don't want war. But war is a path to unification. It will end in the destruction of the North Korean People's Army and the regime and much of the infrastructure of the North. Uh, we don't want that to happen. Third path is instability in regime. Yes, also dangerous, could lead to war. You know, we've got to be prepared for that, but we don't want that to happen. And the fourth path is internal regime change. It's the emergence of new leadership. And this is why information is so important, is because we need to put information first and give the knowledge and understanding of people inside North Korea what the future could be like. And so if new emerging leadership uh, arrives and they understand that unification is the way to survival, then you have peaceful unification and you have the plans made. The key is the Ministry of Unification, putting together the plans for South Korea to abide by their constitution uh, and, and solve the Korea question. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Great, thank you. Now, that's too. We, we, we can't wait to hear the rest of this now, David. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would just say that today, uh, today, Yonhap reported that the Ministry of Education just tagged 34 advisors in Korea for a new vision for unification. Okay, so I'm really encouraged by what Korea is doing. Absolutely. Well, I mean, let me just, the one thing I'll add to that is that, um, you know, I think that that's important. I think the narrative on unification has changed over time. And there was a long period in which, largely post-financial crisis, where it was seen both materially and normatively in very negative terms, right? And I think we saw a shift in that under, um, not so much under Lee myung Bak because he looked at it still very practically, but under Park geun in particular, he saw a shift with the whole notion of Hebak, right? The notion of unification, jackpot. Um, and so it's interesting that the UN administration now is thinking about how they want to frame the narrative on unification. So, on which key information? Oh, is it? Yeah. Uni on. Uni on. Thank you so many back there. Okay. I got you. Any comments or questions? Baby? Um, wait, wait for the mic. Hello, my name is Phoebe Kim, and I work at the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, so just a simple question. Uh, so you're emphasizing comprehensive and unified um, human rights first approach, which is very exciting for me as someone working in the human rights space um, and on North Korean issues. Um, what would coordination um, look like between the communities and the practice of uh, US government mentioned between the security sector um, you know, intel diplomacy? Because um, you had, I really understand the point of having a comprehensive, like full of government code, but um, I was wondering if you could provide an example of what that would look like uh, in terms of like unified messaging, or if, um, uh, like if you're in, a, in, in negotiations, um, like the, like, so I was just wondering, like, what, what does that actually look like? Yes. So, so let me take a first step on that. That's a good question. Uh, my answer to that would be, the first thing would be, as negotiators, Victor, I, Rob, we would want talking points that include human rights. Thank you. That include human rights. So that when we talk about a path to denuclearization and sanctions relief, there's also a path towards normalization of relations. That's the ultimate goal of North Korea, right? Normalized relations. And, and very clearly stating this is the path. And human rights is, is, is front and center. It's the number one. Get it right on human rights. The element of progress on human rights. Transparency on human rights. Getting people. This is, and this is all very doable. I mean, one would have to wonder why this hasn't happened in many ways. So my answer would be as a, as a former negotiator, that would be the first thing. We have a whole of government approach, we have a strategy, and they get those talking points out to the negotiators, and that's what they will drill them. Well, 
I don't know that I can add a whole, whole lot to that. Uh, I came to the conclusion a long time ago uh, that from a non-proliferation perspective, uh, the only thing that would work, whether it was North Korea or whether it was Iran, and I worked both of those accounts at the White House, what we needed to see was a fundamental change in the internal situation. Because reform is not, I think I'm less sort of optimistic than, than Joe in terms of the ability of these regimes to reform. I don't think they're able to reform. I think they survive because in North Korea's case, in part because of advice money, feeling itself off from the world, not allowing information to come into the country to infect the minds of their citizens uh, so that they can have complete control in a very totalitarian context. Uh, and you know it's it, it, you know, and, and I and I've walked through over the years you know, a number of the agreements, whether it's the whether it's the agreed framework or the September 2005, which oh by the way, you know, I had just come on board at the State Department and I called Connie and I said, I didn't sign up up for this. <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. Uh, and we had a conversation and I continued to stay at least until the next time we went down that path in 2007. Uh, but we, uh, we as, you know, as, as Victor said, you know, we, we've tried all these other things. Right? We, we, we've tried all these other things, uh, really with both uh, Iran and with, uh, and with North Korea. Uh, we haven't been successful. We haven't been successful either in the denuclearization component or in the uh, or in the human rights component, and, and, and the list goes on. But I think those are those are the two most prominent. Uh, and we just we just need to we need to change. We need to understand that it's going to take leadership from the top uh, because of the internal resistance and the resistance from some allies in some cases. I think. Uh, as well as the broader international community led by Russia and China in this in this in this context. So we you know we we need we need to understand what all these challenges are and we need to develop sort of a, an approach to deal with each of them if we're going to be successful. Again, this is a really tall order. Okay, this is a hard problem. Uh, but uh, we've got to start somewhere. And that somewhere starts by saying, okay, we need a fundamental shift in how we think about the problem. And practically speaking, you know, in this in this new administration, it would probably be useful to take all the previous policy reviews on North Korea, put those in front of the president and say it should not look like all of these because they all look the same. Right? <laughs> the wheel has been recreated many times already. So whatever you do shouldn't look like this. And anyway, exactly. Yes. Right, right here. We have a Um, thank you. Um, I'm Gino B. I'm the co-founder of Young Leader from Korean Peninsula and at the same time the Master of Foreign Service student at Georgetown University. And I have a question regarding the extended veterans problem. So recently I had a chance to talk with the executive director of 2022 Nuclear Posture Review, and he mentioned that he's a little bit worried about um like make a new like deep group with trilateral cooperation, such as like more nuclear planning group cell. You worried about the problems for the future. So what would be the most like feasible policy options for now for the US government to deter um the escalated threat of North Korea and the sure allies in order to see Asia. Thank you. I think that's a very important, very topical question. I uh, as I mentioned, this administration, I think, is making good progress in that area. The ambassador this morning mentioned the same thing, uh, including their recent visit uh, to, uh, to King Bay. Uh, my sense is that that's, that's not enough. Uh, can we evolve this into something that resembles NATO's nuclear planning, nuclear planning group? Maybe. Uh, then we develop like the MPG did uh, political guidelines for the use, uh, perhaps guidelines for consultation. Uh, but those may be important, but you also need something that's visible. Okay, you need a, to, to to have an effective deterrent. It has to be visible. It can't just be, well, there are submarines out in the Pacific somewhere. Okay, that are going to come to your. Uh, that are going to come to your uh, rescue 
uh, if nuclear weapons are used against you. That's never that's not ne that's never been enough in the past. It's important to have those submarines. Okay, if you start thinking about first strikes, second strikes, and all of that sort of stuff, we could go on forever on that. I mean, that really is my background. Uh, but if, if I'm if I'm a South Korean citizen, I I don't think that's enough. It's a great thing. It's a step forward. But what about you mentioned the uh, nuclear posture? What about the sea launch cruise missile that's recommend, that, that was recommended in the previous nuclear posture review, but that the Biden administration has said no to, despite the fact that Congress is very supportive and is funding it, at least at some lower level. I mean, here you have sort of a, a system that the Japanese have said is very important to extended deterrence, and that the sole government may feel as well. So, I mean, there has to be a capability I don't know about the reintroduction of nuclear weapons, so-called non-strategic, even though I believe any nuclear weapon is strategic. They call them non-strategic nuclear weapons into uh, into South Korea. Uh, if, if I if if I were a South Korean citizen, I would want that. Uh, but for a number of sort of historical reasons and I guess non-proliferation policy reasons, the reasons that I don't subscribe to in this case. Uh, I doubt that that's going to happen. Uh, it clearly won't happen under this administration, whether it would under a different administration. Uh, it might. Uh, I think that's going to deter be determined by whether the South decides that it needs its own national nuclear capability. Yeah, if I were a South Korean, I would probably think we needed our own. But that's just me. So, so let me just add, uh, then go to Victor, who has great experience in this area. Um, it's a great question. It's a, it's a key question. Because as Ambassador Joseph just said, there's a dialogue going on in South Korea now. About 70% of the people saying that they want to, you know, possibly to go nuclear. We saw this in France with De Gaulle and Donna Kennedy, where President De Gaulle said, Thank you. We appreciate the nuclear umbrella and everything, but we like our own capabilities also. So, so movement of uh, robust dialogue, no question about it. Joint planning sessions, joint military exercises, the introduction of strategic assets to those military exercises, a dialogue on a tactical nuclear weapons. I heard what you said about that, Bob, about tactical nuclear weapons. But uh, I don't see any problem, although, you know, H.W. Bush uh, with the concurrent, obviously the concurrent with ROK government at that time in 91, allowed tactical nuclear weapons at that time. But maybe just opening up a dialogue on that. I mean, so that so that countries like China can hear that, and others can hear that. Uh, that, 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 that it's more than just the commitments we've made. Then there, there are elements in place. Uh, I wouldn't go to uh, um, the Republic of Korea having their own nuclear. Well, yeah, I just think it would be inimical for the interest of the ROK to do that for many economic reasons and things. Credibility issues and, and political issues. I don't think tactical nuclear weapon may, may be something else, but open that speak it up. Yes, why not? So I'm going to go to Roberta in a second, but I just on this topic. I, I mean, what is striking to me is that, and I wrote about this in my column in Joseph Noble, that there is a conversation about the South Korean nuclearization. You know, 71 percent of the public say that, but if you actually go and look deeper into the polls, um. A vast majority still think the US security commitment is strong. So, like the next question is, do you think the United States would come defend South Korea? And 68% say yeah. So you would expect that number to be much lower, but it's not. So there's a lot more in that needs to be understood about this view now that it's in South Korea that's not entirely clear yet. So okay, Roberta. Uh, I want to get a better picture of how this would work. You're trying to uh, change the thinking. So I know we're there, and I'm always for anything that's not human right. But I'm just wondering what happens next. Supposing you persuade a presidential candidate to take on your view uh, and introduce a new policy. You sort of feel maybe that's the only way it's going to happen. Um, and supposing they, she does, um, or he does, um, but I think it was true. Um, what happens next? Then? Uh, North Korea has said human rights is an obstacle to peace. So they would not, I think, 
won any negotiations if that issue was going to be up so upfront. Um, and China seems to feel comfortable with increasing nuclear weapons in North Korea as, as the lesser of two evils, the other evil being uh, either unification under uh, South Korea or, or North Korea. So uh, you might not, not get the negotiations, or I'm just throwing out, did you think of the next steps? What are you doing? Are you starting an information campaign? Uh, do you worry that maybe North Korea will become all aggressive with its citizens or isolated? Um, this is a possibility, as Victor points out, they, uh, they, their own sanctions even don't, and, and their uh, uh, rule and ability to be in charge. Um, I just wondered what then would happen? Where are you with this and, and with the pushback which we get uh, on the other side? So can I just follow up? I'm going to look to uh, Pastor Joseph to uh, fully answer your question. I would think the follow-on would be getting information from North Korea, as we did in the Soviet Union. Getting information into there are means of getting information into North Korea, educating, forming, not educating, forming North Korea the 26 million people, and then certainly the elites also, but informing the 26 million people about what's happening not only in, in North Korea but what's happening on the peninsula, what's happening in the world. And, and giving them that sense of, of, of reality. So, so that may be, that, that may lend itself to some sort of, a, who knows what it may lend itself to, enlightenment maybe on the part of some of the elites, or who knows, or, or we're not talking about China, we may be independent and all that, but, but there, are, there are movements where people do, do say enough is enough. So I would think the move would be, but also for those countries that are Supporting North Korea, still supporting North Korea, that have them fully ostracized, to have them as the prize states, as we're seeing with the Ukraine war and so forth. We're talking about China possibly providing weapons to 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 uh, to to Russia uh, to to enhance their invasion so that they they can, they can continue to slaughter the people that they're slaughtering. Uh, yeah, make it more difficult for those who are supporting a, a DPR. A government that are that are in that in that in that, in that regard, and then we're talking about countries like China that rely on, if you will, Belt and Road Initiative, as well as international trade, etc. So I think they have to be conscious of it. I think we have tools available, even without a government willing to come back to the table, talk about the human rights of these issues, so that we can do something in a proactive way. Well, in addition to with everything Joe, Joe just said, I would, well, first of all, I kind of hope it is a she because I think we've tried everything else. <laughs> but I would also say that there's nothing powerful and persistent in the policy community behind uh, the national security rate. Uh, it's a bad idea. Okay. Uh, I'm a veteran of 20 years of combating the ABM treaty. And here you have a treaty that dominated US strategic thinking, going back to sort of our nuclear doctrine and the evolution of our doctrine, all consistent with the notion that defense is a destabilized one. Never tested, but put forward, put forth, I think, first by Kissinger in the context of the negotiation of the ABM treaty. Very seductive idea. Okay, well, there are. If you, know, if, if, if you deploy defenses, it'll start an arms race because the other side will build more, more offensive capabilities. You think that might be accurate? Well, not if you look at the facts, okay? Because what, what happened after we signed the ABM treaty? We had an arms race. What happened when we got out of the ABM treaty? And it's interesting that you know, Putin's comments the day we got out of the ABM treaty are still on the Kremlin website. Surprises me. But he says it's not a threat to Russia. Yeah, it's not a threat to Russia. And oh, by the way, we're going to continue our offensive reductions. So the facts are kind of irrelevant to the argument that defenses are destabilizing. A tremendous myth, very much like the myths associated with human rights and national, and, and, and national security. How did we change that? Well, it took a good number of years to change that. But the ultimate change came when a president was convinced coming into office 
that we needed to deploy against a North Korea threat. That threat had changed, as had the threat from the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union had gone away under his father's uh, during his during his father's term. So we had a we had a new threat. So we thought about the problem differently, and we ultimately got out. There was tremendous uh, resistance in the bureaucracy. The first day I, I came to work on the 20th of January in 2001, the first thing I did was go to the State Department, and say not one word is to be said about the ABM treaty unless it's approved by the White House. Why? Because the State Department had for 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 years. In fact, I once counted the number of joint statements made by uh, the Russian leader and, and President Clinton. Had years said the ABM Treaty is the cornerstone of strategic stability. This is after this is after the Soviet Union had gone away. This is after we had declared Russia not to be a threat. Yet it kept it, you know it, it kept sort of us from from doing what we had to do to defend ourselves against the new threat. And so I put an emphasis on a new president coming into office and appointing the right people with and, and holding those people accountable and having them resourced uh, and with the authorities that are necessary to move the agenda forward. And I think that's the only chance that we have, whether we'll be able to convince a presidential candidate who who's, comes into office of that, I don't know. But I can tell you, if we don't, I would prepare for more of the same. Yes. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Warren Lee and John Cossack's letter. I think I'm fairly swift of a normal day for the Russia Ukraine war already for a year is continuing. Do you think, in terms of butterfly effect, Russia Ukraine war could provide unexpected opportunity for breakthrough in those Korean situations, or more challenges, or ultimately to have two separate local events or Russia Ukraine war with a good or bad? On those well, uh, the, the, the China puts a peace proposal, as they did a few days ago, out uh, for the Ukraine war. And if there's movement on that, if President Zelensky feels that there is something there, and and then and, and China, um, uh, you know, puts a little more meat onto what they're proposing there. And, uh, so that may be maybe a model for uh, China to say, uh, you know, they, they, they will be, let's be blunt, China will get a lot of international credit. What they've done is they're looking for that international credit as a peacemaker. Um, we mentioned the Six Party Park where they hosted the Six Party Park. In this case, they would be the peacemaker. They were the ones who, there's a lot of work to be done on that. So assuming that it is movement on that, just assuming that's a big assumption, right? So if there is movement on that, then North Korea would be next. I, in my view, I could see I could see where Xi Jinping and, and China, or especially Wang Yi, is a counselor, and you know, uh, and, and who, who was the lead uh, uh, Chinese uh, negotiator for the Six Party Belt, uh, had uh, would play more of a role on trying to get North Korea back to the table, better. I can see that, but again, that's in the in the mode of of, of, of burnishing China's credibility again, because they lost a lot of that credibility, right? With the zero COVID, with their support of Russia and the uh, the invasion uh, of, of Ukraine, but some of all the other things, certainly to mention Taiwan, what they did at the Pelosi visit to Taiwan, which is so blatant and egregious. So yeah, I can, I can see some movement on that if it, if it turns out somewhat positive on Ukraine. Uh, personally, you know, domestic, not certain try to, and I know Joe agrees with me that simply having North Korea return to the table is not a sign of progress. That's, okay. the That's not the metric for success. Okay. Uh, having them return to the table and negotiating in good faith, which I've never done, by the way, uh, but that, that would be a measure of success. Uh, so I think we have to, we just have to keep in mind, you know, how you know, how we sort of measure the, in a meaningful way uh, the progress that we can make that we can make with this regime. I'm not, I'm not at all optimistic uh, that, as I said before, that, that they're able to change. I don't think they are. 
I think the only change will come from the North Korean people. And that will be through the influence and information campaigns and the other human rights uh, campaigns that that, uh, uh, that we need to implement. Can, can I ask you, I mean, because you, you touched you, in your last comment, you touched on black time, you touched on a very important point, and that is this is really a strategy addressed to the North Korean people rather than it is to the state in a way trying to separate, create space between the people and the state. Um, arguably, the one thing that has created the most space to date between the people and the state has been the advent of markets in the most people. And so I wonder, does that fit anywhere in your, in your strategy? Because whether we're talking about official markets or unofficial markets, you know, the average one of cream gets much more from those markets than they do from the state. They believe in information markets more than they do from the state. So I'm just curious where that fits in PR. Thank you. Well, I think I think it does fit. Uh, I see I see Dave not, not nodding, and Dave can you know, talk about this in the, in the next panel. I think uh, the emergence of these markets uh, has produced a, a, a dynamic uh, that uh, is very threatening to to the regime. And that's why they have to clamp down on them. Uh, uh, but I think you know it's it's also an avenue for change uh, because there's nothing like sort of personal prosperity to you know in, to engineer change. Uh, uh, and so I think uh, that is one sort of dimension of this sort of internally focused strategy that we need to take into account. I think it's a great point, and I think. Uh, uh, if uh, Joe or, or I were leading sort of an interagency planning session, uh, we'd certainly put that uh, put that in the mix because I think it's uh, it, it has a lot to offer. I, and I couldn't agree more with that. Great question. I couldn't agree more with that, that answer. Uh, it speaks to the leadership in Pyongyang, the public distribution system. It's a failure in the past. It's a failure now. And, it's, and it speaks to where this where the leadership is. In regards to, uh, you know, in one way, Confucian way, the loyalty of the people to the, the leader, but the leader has to take care of the people. The leader is not taking care of the people. When you see mass salvation, even in the 90s, the argument is gone. And we see the possibility of salvation again. When we see significant malnourishment, the hospitals that are not capable of managing things and so forth, is the leader taking care of the people? I would say no. Great. Well, I think we are at the hour at a very full discussion of this very interesting strategy. Again, this is the second time we've discussed it in a in a format like this, and I find it uh, quite quite find it quite well. So thank you, thank you, to Bob. Thank, thank you for uh, everybody else who worked out today. Thank you. Same as your panelists. Well, I don't want to be in the seats. Let me go ahead and introduce my moderator since she won't be able to. And all these young are going to North Korea. Now I'm just planning and here what is the unification, which are all actually unification. Third from the board of directors with the International Council of Korean Studies, and she's also editor in chief of uh, the International Journal of Korean Studies. Dr. Uh, Tara O is a retired U.S. Air Force officer with support the National Security Intelligence Alliance and political military issues of the Pentagon. Uh, she's a professor at the U.S. Air Force Academy, was also a faculty researcher at the Institute of National Security Studies. Um, she holds a B in uh, IR from the uh, University of California, Davis, an MD in public policy from Princeton, and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Paris is going to moderate the event, and I'm going to be a panelist too. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Greg, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Well, welcome to the last panel. Um, I don't know if uh, after lunch panel is better or if the last panel is better. I think there is a competition. But uh, what I ask some of the panel members is to make this exciting, I ask them not to behave. So but I, I look forward to that. Um, except for the timing, of course, because we want to end on time. Um, so I'm going to talk about why this panel is important. Uh, it's about unification. And 
this panel offers a solution to North Korea conundrum. And again, it's, it's unification. But we need to qualify this unification. It really depends on what the state is. We want a free Korea. So we want a unified Korea that's based on freedom, which is what's also written in the South Korean constitution. And I'd say this because North Korea also talks about unification. It, it talks about unification all the time, more so than in South Korea. But of course, what kind of unification does North Korea and the regime want? It wants a unified Korea under its regime. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, we also need to keep in mind that North Korea has theory of revolution in South Korea. And in Korean, it is Nam Joseon Hyung Myung And what this is, is um, to foment socialist revolution in South Korea and then absorb South Korea under North Korean regime. So we have to keep that in mind because for North Korea, they keep this in mind all the time. So now there are various methods to do, doing this, but one is to send agents to South Korea, recruit people um, and create underground party. And when we say underground party, it's, it's an extension of the workers party, the communist party in North Korea. So we have this situation and where, uh, and then they, again, foment all kinds of um, dissatisfaction and demonstrations, basically to, to weaken and to subvert the South Korean uh, system and the government. Shockingly, this is the same goal, the Unified Korea that looks like North Korea, that is the same goal as some of the pro-North Korea groups in South Korea and in the United States, in Japan and elsewhere. And I know that this is not widely publicized, but they do exist. And you can tell because they use, in, in front of unification, they use the term chaju or minjo. So chaju unification, minjo unification. And if you look at the dictionary, chaju means self reliance or independent. But what North Korea means by chaju unification means without foreign powers, specifically the United States. So what they mean is US military withdrawal and the end of the alliance with the United States. So that's what they mean by Chaju uh, unification. And again, that would look like one uh, ruled by North Korea. The other one, Minjo unification. So if you look at dictionary for Minjo, it means nation or people. But uh, what North Korea means by that is, uh, well, Minjo is in Korea, it means like ethnic group, a group of people with same ethnicity. So a lot of Koreans may assume, and I'm talking about average Koreans in North, North Korea as well. They assume that this is always oh, Korean unification, unification Korean people, but it's not. It means more like a Kim Il-sung tribe. So it's people who support Kim Il-sung system. So that's what Minjo unification means. So we have to be very clear how we uh, find the end state of unification. And um, so, I mean, I have more here, but. I'm not really the speaker, so I'm going to introduce the next speaker. And I'm going to start from my immediate right. So we'll start from Mr. Greg Stalatoyo. As you know, uh, he's obviously the executive director of HRNK. And he um, has numerous other roles and positions. He uh, teaches at the Yonsei University in Korea, as well as Foreign Service Institute which is part of the state department here. Um, but he also speaks Korean fluently. And I was actually impressed with his Korean language ability. Uh, he can give speech in Korean a lot better than I can. So, um, and this is something that I didn't know about Greg, and that is that he does weekly uh, skeletal column with the Radio Free Asia for the past 20 years. And this gets broadcasted. So uh, again, um, I was really uh, impressed with yet something else that I discovered about Greg. But um, one thing that I want to point out is that Greg is from Romania, which was under Chao Chao So he knows what it's like to live without freedom and where human rights are suppressed. So he brings this unique perspective. So I look forward to hearing what Greg has to say. <laughs> Uh, 
context is really helpful to explain just precisely about COI bus and uh, the topic. Uh, Victor mentioned earlier um, the fact that North Koreans appear to be more keen on reunification because there is a rather uh, robust version of ethno nationalism that has been one of the pillars of the Kim family doctrine. Of course, nationalism in both Koreas is ethno nationalism and not civic nationalism. So, um, one point that I would like to make is that sometimes the perspective is South Korea, perhaps, is the unification of the land, um, South Korean capital, uh, South Korean technology, uh, cheap and qualified North Korean labor, underground resources. Uh, that is all great, uh, perhaps some match made in heaven. But again, this has to be a unification of Koreans from the South and the North. As uh, Colonel Maxwell mentioned earlier, uh, there are tremendous cultural differences, uh, tremendous differences in uh, cognitive processes, for example. Remember that North Koreans throughout their lives um, constantly feel free to, to disagree, but uh, there is very little debate during an ideological training session. It's not about uh, debating in some common. It's simply about uh, learning in some thought, eventually boils down to the 10 principles of monolithic ideology to the TPMI. There is a fundamental tension between Kim Sonjism and North Korea's constitution, for example. There are wonderful things on paper, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, of course, none of these are observed. And if you read the works of Kim Song, he speaks very adamantly against religion which he regards as a great obstacle to the people's development. So um, uh, these, will be, these will create the difficulties as Koreans from the South and the North come together because the angle of, uh, in, in the North and in the South is quite different. Of course, uh, there are differences in education. One, uh, one story that I hear from all three CAP is that they adapt to life in South Korea. The one thing that they find the most difficult to believe and comprehend is that it was not South Korea that invaded North Korea on the 25th of June 1953, but the other way around. Um, of course, uh, language is another issue. There is absolutely no doubt that Koreans speak the same language, not even two dialects. Remember, Koreans from the South and North lived, shared the same culture, language, history, and lived under the same political system for 1,000 years prior to the separation of the two Koreas in 1945. The millennium is a very long time. Nevertheless, there are significant differences in language. We also talk about these uh, North Korean sub -curists. For example, if you um, tell a South Korean about the country of uh, Chilnagora, they won't understand. It's Montenegro in North Korea. If you tell a South Korean uh, about Hrvatska, they won't understand. It's Croatia in South Korea, Croatia. Of course, terminology. A seminar in South Korea. South Korea has very flexibly adopted uh, loan works from foreign. The seminar is a seminar in North Korea. It's a a gathering, an expert gathering, well, an expert gathering of professions. Of course, uh, language is strictly connected to ideology as well. If you uh, mention the term Sengwatongwat for South Korean, they will understand the term itself, but they will not understand the context unless they have learned about all we are this weekly or at least weekly gathered with people engaged in sessions of self-criticism and uh, pick on others, criticize others, and so on and so forth. And of course, there are so many terms and concepts in South Korea a uh, capitalist and democratic country that North Koreans will not understand. Of course, it's the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, but it's not the democracy, it's not a republic, and it doesn't belong to the people. Um, another factor uh, that I think hasn't been scrutinized sufficiently 
is uh, we've spoken about this regionalism. So there's uh, a rather strong regionalism in the south, but there is regionalism in the north as well. Prejudice against the people in the north provinces, more Hamyan in particular, somehow similar. So rift, the rift between those people and those in Hamyan of the southern provinces could be compared to a certain extent to the, the rift and differences, which have been mitigated to a certain extent between the people uh, of Kyongsang and Chola provinces in South Korea. The South Korean government does a terrific job um, naturalizing North Koreans, of course, pursuant to the South Korean constitution of their citizens for the Republic of Korea. But they go through a three months naturalization process in the Hanoi Center. As you know, they learn how to live in South Korea. They, they get a taste of jobs available in South Korea. Last time I went there, I took my students, they course, my colleagues to the South Korean Ministry of Education. Uh, they were building a, a high rise that was supposed to become a vocational training center. So initially, we gave them a taste of, of uh, jobs available, uh, welders, uh, four brain operators, and so on and so forth. But now the choice is a lot broader. And um, the South Korean government, the people of South Korea, MOU, and Hana One have learned um, how to adapt. That said, there are only 34,000 North Koreans living in South Korea, a population of 25 million. It's a very small number. There are 10 million Cubans living in Cuba and 1 million Cubans living in Florida only. I'm just going to compare this to Florida. It's one tenth of the population of Cuba. So if we were to see the same ratio in South Korea, there would be 2.5 million North Koreans living in South Korea. I think that that absorption capacity does not exist yet. So it's important to be prepared for that day. And during the early days of the Ukrainian refugee crisis, I took time off from HRK and I went to, to visit some of the Ukrainian refugee camps on the Romanian side of the border. So let me tell you a story. During the early days of the refugee crisis, at only one border crossing point in uh, northeastern Romania, Siret, uh, there were 500 refugees crossing the border every hour. There were only two Romanian cops on the other side. So people at the grassroots heard about it, filled up their trunks with water, with water bottles and food, went to the border, brought the refugees, and brought them into their own homes churches, other institutions, and then eventually everybody got their act together, government, angels, Red Cross. It was an absolute international village, people from all over the world, cooking the refugees, aiding the refugees, cops and the border guards, handing out free train and bus tickets. I mean, out of Korea. And of course, uh, Dave, you've been uh, the principal author of uh, 50.7, 50.9, but I think that the people to people relationship is very important. I think that the people of South Korea need to be ready to welcome those from the north, readiness. So, those 34,000 living in the south, if 500 were to cross only one border crossing point every hour, it would take 16 hours for 34,000 people to cross into the south. The issue of transitional justice. Has been brought up as well. Of course, there will be a very complex process. Of course, there will be prosecutions in the case of those who committed crimes against humanity and refuse to protect political prisoners, for example, until the last hour. But there will also be truth and reconciliation, perhaps modeled on the South Africa model and on what was done during the Kim De Jong government um, in South Korea to basically reconcile the past. Of course, uh, there will be property rights, there will be claims in the north. On the other hand, the people of North Korea will have to be protected. Um, Dave, you mentioned uh, the military issues. Uh, the, the U.S. military has been, uh, was extraordinarily successful in the decommissioning of officers and NCOs in East Europe. Uh, so it probably should be the Iraq president. Uh, the, 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 the European, European person rather than the Iraq person, the line. Uh, speaking of Iraq, uh, of course, the Korean Workers' Party is culpable for what's been happening in North Korea. 
the supreme leader equals the Korean Workers Party. Of course, the organiz the organization that is forming the OGD has primarily uh, primary responsibility for many of the crimes against humanity that have been committed in North Korea. On the other hand, uh, if one wants to hold a position of significance, uh, even a university professor has to be a party member. So um, basically, that the process of dismantling the, the Korean work, workers party should follow the European model, the Eastern European model, rather than the de-bandification model. Um, of course, as mentioned earlier by the same speakers, unification of the free, prosperous, democratic, capitalist Republic of Korea will be the ultimate solution to the North Korean conundrum. Both human rights violations, crimes against humanity, human weapons, missile. That doesn't mean um, that surrender through unilateral conciliatory peace declaration treaties uh, in real peace and unification. All of us on this panel and this room do believe that indeed the future being that is what is a unified, free, democratic, prosperous Republic of Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I'm, I'm, I really like the way you ended that. Um, again, we define what kind of end state a unified Korea will be. Next, we will um, reintroduce Dr. Nicholas Everton. He is a HRK board member. So basically, we have three analysts who are related to HRK, and he's a board member. But he is better known as Henry Wen Chen of political economy at the American Enterprise Institute. He has covered a wide ranging topics in his research, like uh, post demographics, economic development, to poverty. And let me mention some of his books. Uh, what is called the end of North Korea, and uh, another one is called poverty in China. But uh, again, it uh, covers various not only different countries and different regions, but also different uh, functional areas as well. But uh, what I really want to, or what I really appreciate about uh, Nick is that um, not only is it expertise on Korea, but it's concern about Korea. In the uh, previous administration of South Korea, in South Korea, there was some serious suppression of freedom that was ongoing. I'm talking about South Korea, not I mean, that's scary, but in South Korea as well. And uh, there were some, it was some desperate times. And what he did was he stepped up and provided a forum where we could discuss and highlight these issues. And the forum was called the Open Society and its Enemies in South Korea. Um, and it was one talk, it was short, it's not an all day long conference, but it was, it was a short talk, but it had a lot more impact on Korea than most people realize. And I know that many, many people in South Korea are grateful for that. So thank you, Nick, uh, for taking the initiative. And with um, that, um, let's talk about you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Friends. Um, have, have you, I wonder, ever thought about this question? How can you tell if you're living in a post war period or an inter war period? Have you ever thought about that? How would you know if you were living in a post war period or an inter war period? I'll get back to that. But it's, I think, an important question relevant to our discussions today. Um, briefly and um, succinctly, the unification of the Korean Peninsula under a constitutional democracy with open markets and an alliance to the large uh, powers in favor of freedom in the world today 
is the formula that will address almost all of the questions that torment people in Nevada and Korea at the moment. The solution to North Korea's nuclear problem is unification. Uh, a lot of this is sort of unification I have described. The solution to the human rights tragedy in North Korea is unification, at least of the sort that I described. And the uh, long term prosperity of the Korean Peninsula is again reinforced, I would argue, by unification of the story I described. I, um, I took the liberty of uh, sharing with Greg, and I think sharing with you, uh, an article that I wrote in 1993 called A Reminder to Seoul, uh, Reunification uh, Benefits Koreans. And I argued back then uh, two things, that the, um, that the opportunities economically from a reunification of the Korean people were much, uh, much more beneficial than the wave of pessimism, which was then circulating 30 years ago, circulating in the wake of uh, some of the uh, tax bills that uh, people in Western Germany were paying during their unification, the particular type of unification, the particular type of financing. I also argued that the longer the unification was postponed, the greater the economic difference between the two Koreas would be, the greater the costs, the greater the difficulties that we would face uh, in reintegrating the divide in Korea. And so here we are today. Um, until last year, until uh, almost exactly a year ago, I think we could say that the post-Cold War period was a time of, broadly speaking, uh, sleepwalking internationally. Uh, a lot of illusions and uh, wishful thinking was dominating uh, international strategy, if you could even call it that, in international relations. And ideas that uh, ideas that high school students in earlier generations sort of laughed at became kind of uh, words of wisdom in circles for describers and deciders. The idea, for example, that great powers could never again go to war. We've heard that one from time to time, but we've heard a lot of that between 1989 and the invasion of Ukraine last year. Uh, the idea that there'd be free money for everybody. Well, we saw a lot of that from central banks during this long period. But the point is that um, because of the extraordinary surfeit of American power during these decades, we were able to play in a way that uh, statescraft usually uh, does not permit. And this is the answer to the question, how can you tell whether you're in a uh, interwar period or a uh, post-war period? It's the caliber of leadership and of statescraft. Um, it gives me no pleasure to observe that the caliber of statesmanship in the United States in the post-Cold War period has been subpar compared to our historical norms. But it wasn't only in the United States. I think you can see if you review the record in uh, the ROK, the a number of fairly expensive illusions were embraced, maybe more by one political party than by another, but certainly by the by many in the population as a whole. The idea, the idea that uh, a reunification would be too expensive, or that it would be too inconvenient, or that we could wait until the uh, the Kim family regime decides to reform itself and uh, allow its prosperity so that the North would be a proper, so to speak, ride from the South. Well, all of these ideas have a great deal of resonance in circles where you might not necessarily have expected that. Well, sooner or later, these bills come due. 
And, um, and I can't tell you exactly when these bills come due, but the, we know what needs to be done. We can hope that uh, it will be done. We can hope it will be done sooner rather than later. Uh, because the ones who suffer the most uh, from, uh, from this uh, politics of convenience uh, are the most inconvenient people on the uh, Korean Peninsula, the North Korean people. Their freedom and their integrity is so inconvenient, um, but it's so essential to building uh, a free and uh, decent and respectable future for the peninsula as a whole. Thank you very much. In this article from 1993, that's 30 years ago, and it doesn't need to change at all. It's still very relevant. Um, thank you, Nick. And next speaker is um, Colonel David Maxwell. So he also holds many positions. He is a board member of HRK. He is senior fellow at the Foundation for Defending Democracies and senior fellow at the Global Peace Foundation. But most recently, he is now the vice president of CAPS, a center for Asia Pacific Stretch. So I don't know if you already started or you did a point it. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's his latest. So we look forward to um to be his uh, leadership there. Um, but I cannot leave out the fact that he said 30 years in the U.S. Army and his special thing with special operations, and he uh, um, had multiple tours in in Korea. So he knows what it's like to work with the uh, Republic of Korea military, as well as the importance of the alliance. Now, um, he often has to explain, but there are two things that I, whenever I see him, he is explaining this over and over. One has to do with off-con transition, which is which uh, was sold as sovereignty issue in Korea, and it's not. So he has to explain uh, what that really is. Um, and, and the other thing that he often talks about is the need to understand the North Korean regime, its goals and strategies. And he repeats it over and over, and I'm sure he'll say it again, but um, the regime wants to survive, and it does it through war, through coercion, through subversion. And uh, so uh, I know uh, Colonel Maxwell wants to say, so uh, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And um, thank you to uh, HRK, and uh, thank you to Ambassador Joseph for your leadership and uh, allowing all of us to be part of uh, a great project. Um, you know, first let me say that uh, I'm glad that Nick uh, brought his article here because uh, that had some effect on me. And when uh, Bob Collins, uh, also a member of the, uh, the, the team here, when he and I were working together in Korea in the 1990s, uh, we wrote the first Con Plan 1529 for North Korean uh, uh, regime instability and regime collapse. Um, we read that article and it had an impact on me. And probably that's probably what, what really was the ignition spark. Uh, for me, thinking about unification. Uh, so I, you know, brought back with members there, uh, bringing that. And like Tara said, uh, it doesn't need any updating. Uh, it is really uh, it's spot on. So uh, I commend that article to everyone. Um, I want to start out a uh, uh, frame. I'm not going to talk about that transition. So I'm going to have one of But Tara's right. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the threat, about North Korean strategy, and then I'm going to dive into the unification uh, planning, which I think is so important and urgent. Um, you know, first of all, to set the stage, I talk about the big five in Korea. Uh, the big five is number one is war, uh, and the, the prime directive for the military is to deter war. Our presence in Korea is to prevent war. I mean, that's, that's the number one, one job. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but that's why the foundation of all strategy is deterrence and defense. Uh, the second is regime collapse, uh, which is also very dangerous. It is unlikely to be like East and West Germany. Uh, and, uh, you know, two things. It is likely to involve some level of conflict up to and including civil war. But the conditions that lead to regime collapse could also lead Kim Jong-un to make a decision to go to war, as Tara said, to survive. It's counterintuitive as that may think. They think going to war may be 
uh, the only option Kim Jong Un thinks he has for survival. Uh, the third is human rights. And we've talked a lot about that. And I will just say uh, human rights is not only a moral imperative, it's a national security issue. Uh, and I say that for two reasons. One, Kim Jong un denies human rights of the Korean people in the North in order to survive, to remain in power. Uh, and I would, would add to that Dr. John Park, the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of East Asia and Pacific, she often asked, Who is Kim Jong un or afraid of? The U.S. military or the Korean people in the North? And the answer to that question is the Korean people in the North, especially when armed with information. That's who Kim Jong un really fears. The people and information are an existential threat to Kim Jong un. Keep that in mind. Um, second part of human rights, and this is part of uh, our information strategy that needs to be every time we talk about. North Korean nuclear weapons, missiles, and the threat, we reinforce regime legitimacy. Now we have to talk about it. But whenever we talk about it, we should also talk about human rights. And we should talk about the development of nuclear weapons and missiles is at the expense of the Korean people. Kim prioritizes nuclear weapons over the welfare of the Korean people. The Korean people are suffering not from sanctions, not from natural disasters, not from the failed economy. They are suffering from the deliberate policy decisions made by Kim Jong-un. Please keep that in mind. Uh, the fourth are the asymmetric threats. North Korea is a global threat. It proliferates weapons to conflict zones around the world. It is conducting cyber warfare around the world. Um, it, uh, it counterfeits our hundred dollar bills. It counterfeits medicine, cigarettes. Uh, it uh, launders money. And of course, it traffics you know, enslaved labor uh, in, in countries around the world. So it is a global threat. Uh, and the last of the big five is unification. Unification is at, at one hand, on one hand, the biggest challenge, but it's also the solution. Okay, so that's the big five. Now, Kim Jong-un is conducting, really his strategy is, is really made of three things. Political warfare, Hera already outlined a, a lot of subversion. Uh, the Reconnaissance General Bureau, the Cultural Engagement Bureau, uh, you know, United Front, they are conducting active subversion operations in South Korea to subvert South Korean society, as well as to subvert the ROC US alliance, which is a key, uh, a key element of, of the strategy. It's conducting blackmail diplomacy. Uh, it is using increased threats, the rhetoric, tensions, and provocations to gain political and economic concessions. And the main concession Kim Jong-un wants is sanctions relief. Not that he really needs it because he's conducting sanctions evasion activities, but because he promised his elite and the military that he could get it, and he's failed to do so. One of the biggest failures of the regime. And so I commend President Moon and President Trump and President Yoon and President Biden for not lifting sanctions. That's key. Okay, As much as uh, we, we people think that lifting of sanctions will cause him to negotiate as a responsible member of the international community, I think we need to, to set that aside. And then, of course, last uh, is the use of force to unify the peninsula. So political warfare, black male diplomacy, and the use of force. And these are interrelated uh, because uh, Kim Jong-un conducts missile tests, launches as part of black male diplomacy, but also to do things like drive South Korea to want to go nuclear. Which, as we heard in the previous panel, that's not something the U.S. wants to do for proliferation policy reasons, things like that. That is an effort to try to drive wedges in the alliance. All these things are interrelated. And actually, you know, I hate to, to show some respect to the regime, but in, in a way, it's, it's pretty smart uh, what, what he is doing to try to, uh, to undermine the alliance, undermine South Korea. Um, so he's got these, these three strategies. Uh, if we talk about regime survival, it is not survival of the nation state, not survival of the Korean people in the North, it is survival of the Kim family regime. And some would say, well, let's just pay them off. Let's send them to a villa in China. You know, let's do a Marcos or Shah of Iran or any of those. Can't we just, you know, I don't think that's what he wants. He wants to rule what I like to call the guerrilla dynasty and gulag state of North Korea. That's, he wants to not only survive, but remain in power with the Kim family regime. So uh, survival is the vital interest. 
The strategic aim was unifying unification of the peninsula through subversion, as I talked about. The key condition splitting the Rock US alliance in order to drive US forces off the peninsula. That is the key condition he needs to be able to use force to successfully execute his, his campaign plan. They, their rhetoric is such that uh, they have to have an external threat. And so they have to show everything that we do, exercises, strategic deployments, all of that is a threat, uh, a perceived threat. Now, we have no desire on forcing regime change, as we talked about. This is not Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, yes, we would like to see North Korea change its regime, but we are not driving regime change by military force. We are not a threat to the North unless he attacks. But he needs to create this, this essence of a threat in order to justify the suffering and sacrifice of the Korean people as he prioritizes nuclear weapons and missile development. Uh, so all of this is, is interrelated. Last thing I'll say is that he accuses us of having a hostile policy towards the North. Uh, you know, that is a key part of the rhetoric. We have a hostile policy. But the truth is that the regime's revolutionary ideology is the hostile policy. Uh, it seeks to dominate the peninsula and rid it of foreign influence, the entire peninsula. It must achieve its objective uh, that he really started in 1945, which was to have uh, a democratic people's republic of Korea. And as Greg said, it's neither democratic nor republican. It certainly doesn't belong to the people. And we must call out this hostile policy. Uh, that needs to be part of our information campaign. Now, I will say that uh, we talk about human rights up front. We talk about sophisticated information and influence campaign. And we talk about uh, pursuit of a free and unified Korea. Consider those like a rope and, and intertwined. Uh, they're all mutually supporting and reinforcing. Uh, and as uh, Ambassador Joseph emphasized over and over again, this is what we need is a holistic strategy where all of these elements are working together and across all our instruments of national power. In essence, you know, Kim Jong-un is conducting a political warfare strategy. We need to conduct a superior political warfare strategy. And George Kennan said, that is the use of all instruments of national power to achieve your objectives short of war, okay? Short of war. And, uh, and we will use all our elements of national power. So we've got to beat Kim Jong-un and his political warfare strategy with a superior one of the Rock US alliance. Now, we talk about unification. I, I get this all the time. Why are we talking about unification? First, going back to 2009, President Iman Bak and President Obama, in their joint statement, we want peaceful unification. And President uh, uh, Obama and President Park, we want peaceful unification. Twice they said that. And then President Trump and President Moon in June of 2017 in their joint statement, you know, we see South Korea to take the lead in peaceful unification. And then in October of 2020 in Yonhap, the only editorial that, uh, that President Biden wrote in a foreign newspaper, you know, he said he seeks peaceful unification of Korea and of course human rights. And, and, but our government has not had a policy of human rights uh, and, and a policy of human unification uh, uh, expressed uh, since then. As I said earlier today, I'm, I'm hopeful because the Ministry of Unification in South Korea uh, is embarking on a major unification policy and, and strategy planning, which I think is so important. Uh, and as I said today, uh, 34 advisors were appointed uh, to advise on that. that. That's a really important step forward. Now, I talked about the four paths of uh, unification earlier, peaceful, war, regime collapse, and internal, internal change. Uh, the peaceful path is the most complex, and this is what the Ministry of Unification must focus on. These are the detailed plans to integrate the economy, political system, the military, uh, and the culture. All the things that, that Greg and, and Nick have just talked about all need to be integrated. This takes detailed planning. And the Ministry of Unification, which we don't have anything of that sort in the United States, and that's a one-of-a-kind uh, organization in Korea, it's got to be the, the main effort in planning. 
And that really needs to be its sole function, not politics, not negotiations, not anything except planning for unification, focusing on human rights, and focusing on information and influence. I would like the, the unification uh, ministry to develop these plans, uh, which they've done a lot over the years. Uh, it's ebbed and flowed, uh, but to develop these plans and then make the right elements of those public. Why? One, to generate international support, which is very important to educate, to overcome many of the questions all of us have here. How is it going to work? You know, why is it going to, you know, why is it important? Uh, you know, and I think that the how question really gets to the, the paralysis that we have in planning for the future. What's going to happen? And that's why I lay out the four paths uh, that those are the likely ways that we get to unification. But whether it's war, regime collapse, or the best case, internal regime change, those peaceful plans, that detailed planning will be applied in every scenario. Uh, and so that work needs to be done. And peaceful unification planning is the morally right thing to do. You're, you, South Korea operates from the moral high ground. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with trying to uh, implement the South Korean constitution and solve the Korea question. What is the Korea question? Paragraph 60 of the armistice signed by military leaders, the military commanders on all sides, recognized that the only solution to the war on the peninsula is solving the Korea question. What is the Korea question? The unnatural division of the Korean peninsula. Read the armistice, paragraph 60. Now, I want to touch on, and we've touched on, on talked in detail about human rights, but I want to talk a little bit about information and influence. There, there are so many ways to get information into, into North Korea now. There's 7.5 million smartphones inside North Korea. Um, you know, we're sending balloons. The escapees are sending balloons. There is cell phone connectivity along the Chinese border. Uh, you know, thumb drives, devices, uh, all kinds of ways to do that. But we need to do more, and we can do more. Um, the, the, the things that we need to focus on, and I've got lots of, of ideas uh, and, and courses of action here that I can lay out. And But let me give you just a, a couple of points. First is the point of information influence is really three things. Change Kim Jong-un's decision-making, give him the opportunity to change. Use the elite and the military to change Kim Jong-un's decision-making, their pressure, force him to change. And then last is for the people to change, to change the regime. So those are the three things. Now, there are four things, four parts. Everybody, information is not spy stuff. It's not, uh, it's not a, uh, you know, very, very sophisticated. What we need to do is focus on four things. Number one, information. Massive quantities of information from news to entertainment. And entertainment is very, very important. The second is knowledge, practical knowledge. Better, best practices for agriculture, best practices for markets, best practices for collective action uh, and to seek political change. We need the truth, the truth about the outside world, the truth about uh, inside North Korea, the truth about South Korea. And then last is understanding. Help the Korean people in the North understand their inalienable and universal human rights, which is so difficult for us to understand, uh, but people in the North do not have a, a concept of freedom like we have, and they need to be educated. Now, I'll, I'll close with this. Um, we need a superior political warfare strategy Founded on a, a foundation, built on a foundation of deterrence and defense, with a human rights upfront approach, a sophisticated influence campaign, and the pursuit of a free and unified Korea. Because the only way we're going to see an end to the nuclear threats, to the crimes against humanity uh, being committed against the, the Korean people in the North uh, by the mafia like crime family cult we know as the Kim Van regime, is through the achievement of unification, the establishment of a united. Republic of Korea, you are okay. That is secure, stable, non-nuclear, economically vibrant, and unified under a liberal constitutional form of government termed by the Korean people. A United Republic of Korea, you are okay, which you could pronounce as you rock. I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Dave, for that passionate um, 
well, presentation, but especially at the end. <laughs> you rock. Okay. Um, I will. Uh, from us, we covered a variety of different issues, uh, from challenges to, uh, and, and he concluded the information portion. Um, I have some questions, but um, I'm actually going to open the floor first um, to make sure that you all get a chance to ask questions. Please identify yourself and then wait for the mic. Um, yeah. Peter. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I hate strategic surprises. And one way to uh, evade strategic surprises is to prepare for most possible outcomes. One that is on nobody's viewing screen is that, that atomic testing in North Korea at some point produced such radioactive clouds that the People's Republic in China decides it's enough. And they go in and they arrange a push and they create a Vichy government in North Korea. And all the nuclear weapons are in trucks headed for its world. That possibility is never discussed. It's the fifth to Colonel Maxwell's list of war. I don't know why it's never discussed, what we can do to raise that possibility that that needs to be admitted to as something to study. Well, I've been involved in track teams with China and South Korea. Uh, one of the scenarios was a meltdown of, of, of Yongyang. And, uh, and what does China do in that situation? And of course, they're going to take action if the radiation goes to its part. Uh, however, I think your scenario of uh, Putin, uh, Putin and uh, you know, they're they're not going to occupy uh, uh, and, and try to take over North Korea. I don't think they want to. They don't want that burden uh, on that. Yeah, I, I got it. But you know, there's no love between North Korea and China, uh, and I think that I think you find a lot of resistance by Koreans in the north uh, to a a, a, a a Chinese dominated government. You know, controlled government. Uh, but your point about uh, taking their nuclear weapons back to China, you know what? Okay, they they take their nuclear weapons. What 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 damage does that do to us? Do do we really need to? You know, in my opinion, if they took all the nuclear weapons out of North Korea, that would be a, that would be a good thing. Uh, but I don't I don't see that scenario as as really being uh, you know as really being very likely. Sure. 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 I guess uh, there are two points to that. The first step, you know, is that uh, the CCP has already given considerable thought to a province, uh, an extra province to China that would look almost exactly like North Korea's current borders, the uh, historical Kogoryo. So uh, that's not just a talk among historians, that's a sort of uh, an implicit policy planning question there already. And it's also supposed to be a message to the uh, DPRK regime. But the other thing you know, I was talking about this stage of illusions that I think we're still kind of mired in. I mean, you're not saying this, but one of the illusions that American policymakers have had is the idea that the CCP would be this sort of deus ex machina that would rescue us from the difficulties that we face in dealing with the DPRK and that the Chinese government would rescue us through the six party talks or would really be able to put pressure on the North Korean government to uh, denuclearize or reform or become uh, an economically viable, self-sustaining uh, government. All of this was just a I were talking to ourselves and convincing ourselves of fantasies. Uh, so one can certainly imagine circumstances under which the Chinese government might feel it was compelled to do something in the North. But I get the sense that the Chinese government is actually kind of scared of the North Korean government. Strange as that sounds, such a tiny country compared to such a big country, 
But if you can think of it this way, if you were living in the apartment next door to Hill and Gallo and he had nuclear weapons, um, and he seemed to have like a little bit more moxie than you have, you might be a little bit careful before you try to use your great disproponderance of power, I guess. Right. Anybody think, Chad? No, not right. Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll take another question. Kenji? Well, the sun is on uh, inside. Um, yeah, that's a great uh, conversation about the uh, UI projects. Then, first, um, international support for free and high Korea. So this is um, yeah, human rights upfront strategy is very important. So by the way, the now the um kind of Biden as we have so of course first priority is the Russia issue uh, invasion to Ukraine. So how we can promote uh human rights issue in the worldwide for the civil society. Um, so like we say that um, yeah, control and book was one, and also uh, testimony of uh, defectors and uh, maybe museum or something. But uh, could you tell us that how to more support the worldwide to so maybe with a quick Well, uh, CSO networks are very important. Um, and actually, the UN COI was very much the result of coordination on civil society organizations from the United States, from South Korea, from Japan, from Europe, from Australia, and from Latin America as well. This is extremely important. What it takes is that galvanizing theme or that galvanizing moment that the UN COI was one of those themes. We do hope that human rights out front will be such a theme. Uh, we've had great press conference today, um, and this is a way to gain some momentum. Um, this is part of a longer campaign. Uh, our HR and K team will be holding the inquiries in Pyongyang, right? Uh, on the 14th of March, we'll be at the European Parliament in Strasbourg, France, hosted by uh, one of the European Parliament Paris, is the whole event from the Netherlands, Pierre Boulot. The French historian and author of the book is one of the panelists. Together with Bob Collins, uh, three former North Korean political prisoners. Uh, on the 17th of March, we will be in Geneva, Switzerland, hosted by the Permanent Mission of Australia, co hosted by the United States, the Republic of Korea, uh, the European Union, uh, and Romania. Uh, that's Again, another way of galvanizing support and attention doing UN side events. This time, exactly on the 10th anniversary of the resolution that established the US COI. Then we'll hop on a plane and we'll go to Seoul for an event on the 20th of March, hosted by our board member, Bastian John Hong Dean of GSI at Yonsei University, with whom this is Yonsei. So, CSOs need the resources to do this. Uh, many of you, these organizations have the know how, but they need the resources and they need the networks. Um, you have a great network, each organization. So, uh, yeah, we have a great platform to uh, help us worldwide. Thank you for your quick comments. That it, it, what you said about this war in Ukraine, you know, attacking us, but that's also an opportunity as well for civil society. Uh, but I would say the United States, yes, we're distracted there, but, you know, for the last year, I mean, we've deployed a tremendous amount of strategic assets in the Korean Peninsula. You know, we've, we've increased our exercises. I mean, we've done a lot more than, than people would think. You know, so I, I think we can walk and shoot down. But uh, I think, you know, and I think that U.S. leadership is important. I'm heartened by the appointment of uh, Julie Turner, uh, the human rights. I think that's important. But just because... Not everyone's focused on it, it doesn't mean civil society. Yeah. And as Greg said, I, I think it's really important. It is it, it's civil society that drives a lot of change. So I think it's, you know, it moves us all as members of civil society to, uh, to contribute to that. So I think you have a great point. 
The civil society contribution is indispensable. The political leadership is also desperately, desperately needed. Um, if you look at the um, chessboard, the battlefield, I don't know what the right analogy is, uh, for, the, uh, for the global movement for North Korean human rights, the, um, the huge gap is in South Korea. Um, and I don't think this is the time or the place to go into the reasons for the psychopathology of South Korea's approach to North Korean human rights. But it is a most of the governments over the period since the uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall in the ROK have been missing an action on the question of uh, the circumstances of people who under their constitution qualify as citizens of their country. Uh, and right now there's a uh, there's a government in place that I think is a very sympathetic viewpoint to the question of human rights for people in the northern half of the peninsula, but so much more can be done. And that would have such a huge multiplier effect on what you were describing. Uh, we could also have a little bit more help from down the block. A student on your account. Thank you. Um, um, I'm Gene Lee, uh, registered student from Georgetown University and um, co founder of the Young Litter from Korean Peninsula. Um, I have a question regarding um, I think the, one of the most significant obstacles for unification in South Korea is I would be a perception of a young generation, probably, because a recent poll shows that uh, like at least 20% of young people in South Korea are in favor of the reunification. Um, the most significant reason for that there is uh, probably um, the economic reason and more like, you know, it has been divided for 70 years. I think that's kind of like some kind of disconnections would be the most important option. So what would be a good like approach to, in order to persuade the young generation as um, as your experts um, perspective? Thank you. I'm glad you brought up that question because that is an uh, issue. Um, that's the generation that has to pay for it if this happens uh, in their life. So, uh, and she, you need some young people. I mentioned young people a long time ago. One of the things you talked about was the German education, and you know, basically, they use one Muslim mark equal to one Eastern mark, which mark, and that was one of the issues. So, maybe you can talk about that. Um, um, well, it's it's we we have this. Fascinating situation in the South now, where we have uh, a rising generation of young men and women who are the best educated, the most prosperous, the most secure, I dare say the most hampered of any people that have ever lived on the Korean Peninsula. And almost everything seems to be too inconvenient to do. Uh, it's too inconvenient to get married. It's too inconvenient to have children. Uh, reunification is way too convenient. <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole other story altogether. But history is just a funny thing, you know. Um Proxy had a line, and I'm going to um paraphrase it. Uh, young people today may not be interested in unification, but unification yeah. may be interested in them. Yeah. And how they rise to the occasion is going to matter in that slide. So let me give you, I don't think you're going to be able to convince them. I don't think you'll be able to raise the polls, but I, I agree with, with Nick. When it happens, it's going to happen. But I, I'm heartened by a Korean admiral once told me there are two miracles in Korea. Uh, and of course, we all know the miracle of the Han. And Korea rose from the ashes of the war. You now it's the 10th largest economy in the world. Uh, you know, really a great middle power contributing to arsenal democracy. Um, and so that's the the miracle of the Han. So I asked him, what's the second miracle? And he said, the, the second miracle was the miracle on the Tano, the Algon. And I said, really, what miracle is that? He said, the miracle is that after seven decades of the worst oppression in history, the Korean people in the North still survive. And he made this point that at the division of 1950, Korea was one. And then they went their separate ways. But there is still the spirit of the Han in all, all Koreans. 
And he said that if Koreans are faced with hardship, they are going to survive, north or south. And if they are given opportunities, they're going to thrive. And we see this on both sides. And, and in the north in particular, uh, we have seen since the arduous march, the growth of markets, the resilience, and, and people are thriving, you know, and obviously a much different level than in the south. But that, that innate spirit of the Han is, is you know, all Koreans. And when unification occurs, I think most people will get on board. I just don't think you're going to be able to convince people before it happens. They'll stand up and they, they will step up uh, when the time comes. Okay. Of course. So, no, I, I agree. But uh, I think Nate, the Petrosky quote is great. So, I agree with all of you. Unification is inevitable. Uh, what I tell my younger audiences in South Korea is that. Um, Again, Koreans lived together under the same political system for 1,000 years prior to this uh, separation, with the great differences today. Uh, Germans lived under one unified German state just for about 100 years prior to separation, so there's a big difference right there. So it's simply not a matter of choice, it's a matter of destiny. It's a great opportunity to be part of the generation that managed to reunify Korea. This can only be taught through textbooks again for information. We need information in the north. We also need information from banks in the south. There's no doubt about that. Make sure it has not stopped you. In case or in your condition that North Korea needs. Hello. Um, my name is Yunus Mundi. I'm a North Korean escapee and college Foundation. Um I'm very glad to see uh, the paper, the comprehensive strategy, country North Korea, and I'm glad we are talking about the education. So I escaped North Korea in 2014, and I, I was surprised at many things happening in South Korea and United States, but there are particular things I was surprised, especially uh, it seems to me South Korea didn't have more education. And even though uh, President Bakune mentioned about unification as Bonanza, but there's no practical strategy and the policies focus communication. So on the other hand, North Korea is all about unification. And in their constitution, they mentioned the final victory of North Korea's revolution is unification by force. So I was surprised, I think. And the second thing I was surprised was North Korea had been very persistent on um, influential campaign against the United States and South Korea. They never stopped the information influence campaign, I would say psychological warfare. And um, if you look at the uh, North Korean propaganda websites, they were very persistent for many decades. And but I don't see any the influential campaign from the US and South Korea side. So my question is, so why we stopped or abandoned psychological warfare, even though we know it's very difficult. And the second question is, to me, unification can solve everything. As Dr. Um, Nicholas Stott mentioned, unification will benefit Koreans, but it, I would say it also benefits Benefits Alliance, United States, and China too. So, to me, I think unification solves the deprivation, human rights issue, and then all the economic benefit for Korean people. So, why the US and South Korea talk about not talking about the unification issue? That's my question. Okay. There are be two parts to it, and uh, one about the psychological operations. Why do South Korea do that or do more of it? It's simply North Korea is confident. So uh, maybe we'll start with the special operations, psychological operations kernel there. But I hate to speak for South Korea, but it seems to me that uh, they, they stopped uh, you know, using psychological warfare uh, in an attempt to. Uh, you know, focus on diplomacy as if that would somehow appease 
uh, Kim Jong Un, and, uh, and so I think that's uh, that's one one thing. You know, I'd say for the United States, we are risk averse. We are averse to information. I've said this many times. It's easier to get permission to put a hellfire missile on the forehead of a terrorist than it is to get permission to put an idea into his ears. We're very afraid of, of using information that it would backfire, and, uh, and that's something we have to overcome. I, I mean, I think it, you, know, you are asking the question that both presidents should hear. You know, why aren't you using the information? You know, and and you as a state lead from the north, does information from the south and from the U.S. work on you? Does it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. That's justification right there. So you know that that's what we need to. But I think the U.S. is afraid of information, and we got to get over it. What else? Just one question, because every mice accustomed to the status quo. Bureaucracies were mentioned earlier on because the huge headache to deal with South education. Uh, there are some tremendous examples of reconstruction of the Marshall Plan after the Second World War. Why not Eastern Europe after the end of the Cold War? They're not the richest country in Europe, but there's so much better off than it was the years ago in terms of their economies, uh, political scene, and also in terms of security, since many of them have joined NATO now that what they're facing right from the east. Um, but of course, uh, the war in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan as well uh, did not help. Uh, the whole idea of uh, a nation building, building nation that had been around for thousands and thousands of years, it was not a nation that had to be built, the issue was different. So uh, in the case of North Korea, things will be very different. There are thriving economies all around North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and China as well. And of course, there is the, the, the good Korea, the viable model, uh, free, democratic, prosperous uh, South Korea. We mentioned this uh, multiple times today. Well, perhaps that's what the narrative should be. But again, it takes a lot of persuasion. And this effort is precisely about that uh, engaging in a bit of creative thinking, the paradigm shift that Abbasid Joseph was addressing. Uh, you know very well there's an unfin there are two unfinished civil wars in the peninsula, and only one of those unfinished civil wars is between the northern portion and the southern portion. There's a, a unfinished civil war in the south that uh, Tara and many other people have written about quite eloquently. And uh, appreciating the nature of that very deep and bitter civil war, I think helps us to understand the hesitance to approach uh, unification and the sort of the spirit and the verb that maybe we might uh, want to see. The excuse, of course, is, and this has been an excuse used again and again over the last 30 years, is that even thinking about unification, I mean, not really, Using the word, even thinking about it, is a is a, a cause of war, uh, of and so there's um, that's a very good strategy if you are on one side of the civil war. It's not a very good strategy if you're on the other one. Okay, due to the limited time, uh, we'll have to end here, sadly. Um, please give a round of applause. For so today, as planned. We have celebrated the COI plus 10. We have addressed security, human rights nexus, and we propose a strategy moving forward focused on human rights up front, relying primarily on two pillars more effective information campaigns, better and customized content, better targeting accuracy based on some boon criteria, based on a full understanding of the North Korean social strata, also why not better and more effective technology. Uh, let me conclude by thanking uh, all speakers and moderators. Let me thank uh, Dr. Bacon, Alva, and her crew here for uh, putting on another great show again. And uh, of course, my HR and colleagues, our Director of Operations and Research, Raymond Ah, uh, associate Laura Morrison, and of course our research interns. They've been perfect today. They've uh, 
lit up Twitter. Take a look later if you get a chance. Uh, Yoshi Yoshi Yamauchi, Joseph Yo Choi, Abigail Morma, and and thank you very much. We've done great work today. Thank you. Here, here, here.